Sydney accidentally pressed the button. I've done it myself, Sydney. Don't worry about it.
right, good morning. The music has stopped, so that's uh, our cue to get things rolling. Good morning. Uh, welcome to day two of the eighth annual SLO Symposium. Thank you very much for joining us for the plenary session. Yesterday's day, uh, with some technical difficulties, went, went very, very, very well. We've been receiving really some good supportive emails. So thank you very much. Again, kudos to the team. Kudos to everyone who helped us uh, uh, make, make this event happen. Fresno City College and others really appreciate your, your help. Um, with that, I would like to take it, uh, turn it over to Stacy, who is going to talk about the logistics. And uh, later, I'll be here to introduce the uh, plenary speaker. Welcome. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Stacey Teeters, and I am one of the co-coordinators for the symposium this year, uh, along with Yarek, who has been the symposium creator and um, been holding the torch for many, many years as well. Um, I am a regional coordinator in the San Diego Imperial Region and serve the Foundation for California Community Colleges. We are also joined uh, by our wonderful co-host for this year um, from Fresno City College, Enrique. Enrique, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? On behalf of Fresno City College, faculty, staff, and administration, I'd like to welcome you. My name is Enrique Jauregui. I am the SLO coordinator for, for, for this wonderful institution. Our priority is to place students first to ensure the lifelike learning needs of our diverse population. Once again, welcome. Now, it is a great honor to recognize and thank the planning committee who contributed to the eighth annual SLO symposium. Diligence and perseverance to have this first Zoom SLO symposium. My gratitude also extends to the incredible Fresno City College faculty, classified professionals, staff that helped make this event happen. Thank you all. Of course, none of this would have been possible with the support received from our symposium sponsors. Listed here are the institutions and, and organizations that collaborated to bring this event all to you. On this second day, we wish you a notable and meaningful SLO Symposium. Thank you. Thank you, Enrique. So just some quick housekeeping for the day. Um, as yesterday as well, we encourage you to be active on social media, on our various social media platforms, utilizing the symposium hashtags, hashtag SLO Symposium 2021, as well as our conference theme hashtag of ensure equitable learning. We also have these outcomes as a reminder from yesterday. We really hope you are engaging in these conversations. You are able to take this into practice, but you're also building networks of support as well um, through this event and through other events that the SLO Symposium group plans to put on again throughout the year. Wanted to also provide you with a quick overview of today's agenda. Um, we'll also post again the program in the chat um, for you to view. Of course, starting with our keynote speaker, Dr. Davis Jenkins. Um, we'll also be spreading out breaks throughout the morning as well. Um, so we'll keep you refreshed and ready to keep learning and continue learning. At 10.15, we'll be beginning our panel with our three wonderful guest speakers and then move into an intersegmental conversation. And then we hope you stick around to the end because that is really where we get to have that community conversation and dialogue about what this work means, how we move forward and how we support, continue to support one another. So with that said, I'll kick it back to Yurik. All right, good morning again. Thank you very much. My name is Yarek Yanyo. I'm the SLO coordinator from Santa Ana College. And this morning I have the pleasure to introduce our plenary speaker for the day, Dr. Davis Jenkins, one of the authors of Redesigning America's Community Colleges book that brought us Guided Pathways. By now, we, are all, we all have experienced the impact of the initiative at community colleges in California and across the country. Uh, higher education institutions, mindful of the cafeteria model of course selection fostered for decades, put significant resources into onboarding, counseling, 
and making sure that students leave our institutions because of international in, intentional focus on completion of specific courses and predetermined programs. In the midst of these activities, the fourth pillar of guided pathways, however, seems to have been missed. Meetings focused on accountability in our campuses are filled with very well articulated reasons why our students are not progressing through programs, why they are not completing colleges at expected rates, or why they fail the courses. None of those reasons seem to have anything to do with learning. While learning on our campuses can be implied, it is often inferred, and it remains mostly invisible as expressed by one of the symposium panelists just yesterday. Guided pathways have not resulted in discussions about critical pedagogy, active learning, or understanding by design. Instead, whatever happens in classrooms is, as it always has been, veiled with a notion of uh, academic freedom, which really means that support for teaching and learning cannot match the resources, energy, and focus owned by admissions and records, outreach, or counseling. Makes you think. If community colleges are not about teaching and learning, then what are they about? So he has radical idea that I, that, you know, to address that. I heard this during one of our SLO discussions we've been having on Fridays since the pandemic hit. What if guided pathways started with ensuring learning and institutions were restructured around teaching and learning? Back in October of 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, Community College Research Center published a report, The Economics of Guided Pathways, Cost, Funding, and Value. The report was issued to help community college leaders understand the costs implement, uh, involved in implementing guided pathways and develop plans for funding and sustaining them. And just like people close to the fourth pillar of guided pathways have been saying all along, ensuring learning is not at scale at any of the colleges participating in the study. Dr. Jenkins, here's the challenge for you. Would you please put these notions in a perspective from ours, from your perspective? Would you please let us know what, is, what just happened and why learning has been so large, largely absent from these efforts? More importantly, what are we to do now? Where are the beacons of hope for teaching and learning to be validated on our campuses? With that, Dr. Jenkins, thank you for joining us. Nice to be here, Yark. I wish I were with you guys in California. I'm in sunny Chicago, where it's like 22 degrees. And I can always rely on my friend Yark for giving me these softball questions. You know, I could just, I could just hit this one out of the park. It's so easy. But as always, this guy comes, hits right to the heart of the issue. And we have been learning this ourselves. I mean, if pillar four is so essential to achieving equitable student success, why is so little effort being put into it? So um, I'm just gonna give a little bit of overview of what we've learned a lot uh, since we published uh, Redesigning America's Community Colleges and give you a sense of what we've uh, learned in the process. Um, and, you know, this is humbling. We've learned this from you folks, and it's been a journey. I want to frame this by saying that despite what people say, education and learning are have never been more valuable. Um, this is the, you know, measures of the economic value, and we know that Education has more than just economic value, but you know you need to have economic security before you can advance socially and um, you know move up uh, support social as well as economic mobility. But this is this shows the number of workers in the U.S. in good jobs by their education level, and you see this straight line moving up a little bit of a flattening during the Great Recession. Among work, workers in good jobs, that's defined as 35 grand per year for younger workers. And these jobs typically pay benefits and provide opportunities for learning and advancement, formally and formally. But the blue line is, is good jobs, the number of good jobs held by workers with bachelor's degrees. And uh, the red line is those held by uh, workers with certificates or associate degrees. Um, 
Uh, and 80% of those are applied associate degrees, like in nursing or uh, business technology or engineering tech. And the yellow line is the number of good jobs held by people with um, uh, with high, just a high school diplomas. Now, um, you know, uh, so employers for good looking good jobs are looking for degrees, but they're also looking for you know, and it's hard to know what to call them. I should, I, I know this is, this alone is going to, I'm talking to SLO people. I should have been up on my, they're sometimes called 21st century learning skills. We call them, I call them know-how. Uh, I've been in this business, the 21st century skills during the Clinton thing. I helped to write the secretary of labor scans report about these applied learning skills. And anyhow, the key thing about these skills is that they, they really can only be learned by active and experiential learning. Of course, I think anything only can be learned. But uh, the, the left-hand figure is, you know, how much these, these different competencies are in demand. And the right one is even more important. What's the economic premium associated with jobs that demand these things? And look at them. And this is... The number one always is, and this is very solid research, by the way, and there's other research that's come out recently that's very rigorous. Communication is always number one. Problem solving and complex thinking, always number two. So I'm trying to say, you know, there, I'm not knocking skills training, but if people are telling you that people can get a job, you know, some two-week Google training and then get a good job, um, uh, and, you know, work at Google, they're wrong. It's a lie. Um, that's not saying that skills training, but, you know, on the other hand, we can't just have, you know, generic academic degrees that, that don't have active learning. Um, so you, what employers are really looking at for is degrees plus evidence that uh, you, you can learn skills and you can do these things, which really the evidence comes from project learning. And that, you know, can be in the workplace, but it also can be in school, in theater, in a history project that is substantive. In, you know, cert, you know, uh, uh, you know the kinds of work that uh, you can do in an in a English class. But it's got to be project learning that emphasizes these things. Students don't like doing this stuff. They're used to just getting the multiple choice and, you know, churning through. But, you know, uh, anyhow, I'll go more on this in terms of equity. But, you know, our, our labor force is highly stratified by education. And, indeed, I could go on. But our education system is essentially set up to – to stratify by race and income. It is by design. And community colleges aren't intentionally in this process, but they have evolved to do this. And one reason, one way is that community colleges, even though they serve uh, the largest number of Latinx students and Native American students and the largest share by far of uh, low income students, they're the least resourced. So precisely because you serve brown students and low income, you're, you're uh, low resourced. And that's part of the reason why, you know, the outcomes aren't so good. Only 41% of students overall achieve any kind of degree, uh, you know, certificate associate or bachelor's in six years. And uh, r remember that first graph about the bachelor's in higher or the applied associate. Only 10% of African American students who started community college get a bachelor's six years later. Um, here are the numbers nationally, and here's California. Uh, California, whereas 41% of students get some degree within six years nationally, in California, community college starters six years later, only 36% have a degree. Um, and that's 18% uh, have a bachelor's degree. But here's the big thing. 23% are still enrolled six years later. <laughs> So first of all, I want to hire those students. Those students have grit. And, you know, yes, students are going part-time and blah, 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 but we can go all in this. There's no reason we shouldn't help students because that's just too long to get a credential, a meaningful credential within six years. Um, uh, that's just too long to be in poverty. But this belies the fact that students have uh, don't have grit. So uh, of the 
of the certificates that California uh, 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 awards each year, only 21% are associated with you know good jobs that pay 35 to 40,000 median salary up. I am not knocking certificates. I'm just and, and skills training. This I've spent much of my career working in the CTE area, and the point is here: we can't have CTE and academic. We got to work together. They need students need skills as well as you know uh, broad thinking that you can learn both through CTE and through academics. And they need degrees especially bachelor's degrees, and every bachelor's degree, even in career areas, has a liberal arts uh, and sciences component for good reason. Um, similarly, only 19% of the associate degrees awarded by California community colleges are in these higher, uh, you know, uh, direct return. Um, and these are the applied associate uh, degrees in healthcare, uh, in the in protective services, in fire and police, because those jobs are unionized and uh, uh, business technology. My wife has a, a, a associate degree from Bunker Hill Community College in uh, business techs. Very good degree. Now, of course, uh, you, you know it's true that most of the associates you give are transfer degrees. But transfer degrees only are valuable to students if they're able to transfer with junior standing in a major. And nationally, uh, just about, uh, you know, uh, only, only about less than 60% of students are able to transfer most of their credits. 15% cannot do that at all. And those that can transfer most of their credits toward their major, not transfer it and you know, uh, 90 credits, and then start as a sophomore, a first year term sophomore in their major, um, uh, do are much more likely to complete. And California's got an excess credit problem. Uh, this is from your own dashboard, your lunch board, the average number of units accumulated by, by uh, uh, associate degree is over 90, even for the uh, for the, uh, uh, yeah, let's see. Yeah, so um, this is for uh, all associate earners, associate degree for transfer earners of the blue, a little bit better, but it's still crazy. So on average, and remember in California, it's community colleges that are serving the, the largest share of, of students of color and, and uh, uh, low income students who need bachelor's degrees or you know applied associates. And yet we're turning them out here with, on average, 90 credits, a whole, you know, they should be starting as seniors in their major, but they're not. So, you know, this, these kind of things led us to this, uh, the, this idea of the cafeteria college. You know, the program uh, paths to degrees are not clear. Uh, new students aren't helped to explore interests and um, uh, develop a plan. Students' progress isn't monitored. And... Uh, than learning too few students experience active and experiential learning. So um, we've been, uh, so, um, you know, uh, this led to this guided pathways idea and these four pillars, which I know you're sick of hearing me say, and Yark gave my email, I'm sure I'll get a lot of hate email for these four uh, pillars. Uh, but um, you're, you're familiar with, with these ideas here. Um, we've been stu uh, about 400 colleges nationally are part of, uh, of formal guided pathways efforts. That doesn't mean they have fully implemented guided pathways. Um, I'd say the we'd say conservatively the number nationally is probably uh, 70, and of those, uh, those are the ones who are really starting to get into the learning, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But we've been tracking 120 colleges nationally over five years implementing uh, guided pathways. And this includes uh, AACC colleges, AACC pathways, and uh, all the colleges in uh, Tennessee, Ohio, Washington, um, and 20 in California that were part of the California Guided Pathways Project. And this has led us to some learning, our learning outcomes here. Um, you know, in the uh, in the book, we focused on college completion, and there's been big focus on college completion. But it's very clear, become more and more clear that um, 
that the goal can't be just to churn out more students with associate degrees or degrees. It's got to be degrees that have value uh, either in terms of direct employment and, and uh, pre preparation for further education and learning. So they have to be high value. And this is the equity question because uh, unfortunately, uh, students of color, low-income students, disproportionately, when they do earn it, earn the the low are in low return programs. And we've done made a, this a big focus. This is a big equity issue. We made a lot of deal about maps, and I'm sorry, you know, the, the mapping. I think a lot of colleges got hung up on maps. Um, and, you know, we're academics, you know, what did we know? It's just a book. You we weren't supposed to, it was supposed to sit on a shelf and collect dust. And maps are actually important. And they're, they've been important mostly to bring people in the, in the uh, college who don't talk to one another across to talk about the student experience, including and especially the learning experience. But the whole goal is not just to develop all these maps. It's to have every student have a customized plan that they can follow so that they can see how far they go, but so that they can see the coherence of their education and why the liberal arts piece of it fit in here and where this leads. Um, number three, you know, we made a big deal about, and we've seen a lot of colleges really up career and college exploration for students, but more and more, it's not just, you know, the career center or, you know, at orientation, more and more, uh, the research suggests that what's most important is connecting students with other people in a field they're interested in. I'm not just talking about a career field. I'm talking about the theater people, um, the, uh, the, folk, the students who are interested in drones. I mean, we know the healthcare people, they're, they're wearing their uniforms and they're, they're not a cult, but they're a, they're a community, you know? The research suggests that it's all about engagement and in a community college, that's Vince Tinto, of course, but he was talking about students at Syracuse University and elite residential to community colleges, students are gonna be engaged in the classroom and in programs. Um, there's been a big focus on remediation. I actually helped, you know, some of my research around 2008 and nine started to question remediation and then I started looking, well, what about other courses? Anatomy and physiology, American civilization, econ 101, psych 101 actually are just as determinative as English and math. And this is maybe the most dramatic thing where, you know, the idea shouldn't be to get students ready for college through running through high school over again, the two courses they hated most, but it's to teach students to be confident learners in program foundations, not just math and English. And I know you guys, these SLO people are like, I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, and, you know, we, you know, especially in California, but everywhere, uh, you know, dual enrollment has just sort of been like students taking courses and, you know, it's up to the student or the high school or whatever is available. But really, uh, we just came out with a study from Aspen looking at dual enrollment as an equity play. And basically what this means is applying these principles to dual enrollment students, too, not just to your post high school entrance. So five years later, these are the things we most think are most important. Backward designing programs so that they lead to good jobs or transfer in a major. Increasing the number of black males in California who get associate degrees is not going to achieve equity unless those associate degrees uh, enable students to get good jobs or transfer in a major of the student's interest. And I'm not just saying in STEM or business. I mean, ethnic studies, liberal arts, I don't care. Um, but it's got to be what the students are interested. Those have value. Academic and career exploration needs to lead to a plan that the students have. I know you guys are legislated to have plans, but they're really, you know, kind of weenie. And I just don't see that we can take students' money or the taxpayers' money anymore and not have a full program plan, which will change. But, you know, for students with families, and then to guarantee we offer those courses on the plan. So there's been a lot of attention to these two things. The two most important things in general for student success. And I would say, and this is humbling, that, that the work on the first two things has really been doing away with 
stuff we should have shouldn't have been doing in the first place, like prerequisite dev ed, or um, you know doing stuff we should have done, like every student on a real plan. But these other things. So in other words, we're sort of where we are in student <laughs> achievement, where we would have been without this other stuff. But the real important things, if we're really going to boost learning and close equity gaps, these are the bottom two things, academic and career communities, connecting students with faculty, other students, uh, you know, other people, uh, employers, uh, you know, people in the community, in a community, in an academic and career community. This, again, is not just all about careers. It's about, you know, people are into, you know, Social behavioral sciences, my field. And then very importantly, the research is definitive. Uh, most of it, much of it coming from K-12, but um, there's more and more in higher ed that um, we really have to ensure that students have an active and learning experience from the start. And the, they have to have a light the fire learning experience from the start. And I'll talk about that in a, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, uh, like I said, there's lots of research from K-12 on the, uh, the benefit for underserved students of active and experiential learning. Hank Levin, my colleague at Teachers College, who was at Stanford for many years, developed the uh, essential skills. He used to say, don't remediate, accelerate. And by accelerate, he did not mean co-requisite, where you take the remediation and put it up here next to the college level course. He meant hold, uh, teach, uh, 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 you know, underserved students uh, from underserved communities and schools to high standards of rigor, but uh, most importantly, make them think. And there has been a lot of research in higher education in the STEM field that, um, that really reinforces this. Most of it has been in four-year institutions. And this book here, which um, uh, is, in my view, the most important research on uh, guided pathways that's come out, um, you know, in the last five years, um, by Julie Wong, a colleague at uh, University of. Uh, so this is from CCRC, <laughs> um, uh, from uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, and she looked at students who start in a community college intending to transfer in STEM. This is something we look at a lot, but and very few students are able to start at community college and go to STEM. And she, her research, which not only looks at student progression, which is what a lot of my and CCRC's research does, she actually measures uh, through very rigorous surveys, their experience in classrooms and their, their social capital outside of class and uh, other factors, not just sort of their characteristics and their progression and what they're taking, which is important. That's sort of what CCRC has done. Um, and what she finds is that, um, yes, students don't, it, the path to STEM transfer is incredibly unclear. And she is especially focused on students of color and low income students. But, but for in general, these students are trapped up because the paths are unclear. No one's helping them get a plan. But the, 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 and most importantly, uh, and, and they're not being engaged in, with other students who are interested in STEM early on. But the factor that she finds most important for those students who started community college to get a bachelor's degree in STEM is uh, early active learning. And not only are, you know, does it help that students pass courses, but the experience of active learning enables them and motivates them to, to be retained and persist in STEM programs, which are hard programs. Uh, the big problem uh, is uh, with STEM is that, you know, uh, a proportionate number of minority students enter STEM programs, but they don't complete. Uh, they drop out. And Julie's finding, reinforcing research, the best research on cognitive science and learning from higher ed and the massive amount from K-12. Yes, uh, plans are important. Yes, uh, scheduling is important. These things that have been the focus of guided pathways. But if you really want to improve learning, you want to improve equity, and you want to retain students, 
you've got to have a light the fire learning experience in term one. The problem she finds is that most of these uh, students are finding active learning mainly in CTE courses. And that's fine. I'm not knocking CTE, but those CTE courses do not tra transfer to bachelor's degrees in, in, um, in STEM. So uh, I could talk about a study we did for Google that comes to similar conclusions. A lot of these students think they can transfer, this was in California, transfer to CSUs, but they're taking CTE information technology courses and no one's telling them this and yet the you know they have to go through several levels to get to the transfer level stem courses that they would need to take to transfer in say computer science um she fundamentally rejects as do i that these students don't have grit we cannot blame the student for this she i mean these students i mean uh, uh my buddy diego navarro uh many of you know him uh, he fundamentally rejects that the most disadvantaged students don't have grit, man. They're showing up in your class and they're dealing with hell. I know we all are, but they're, they've come through a lot. But, you know, uh, our, we need to come through with them on these more bureaucratic things, let's say structural things, but especially on learning. And this is the key equity play. The problem is, um, you know, and everyone says, yeah, yeah. But when you look at the first term courses, take a look at the courses your students take uh, during their first term. Um, and uh, this was from a particular college, but uh, Kathy Booth did this recently of West Ed in California. And this, what we have here is very typical. DevEd Algebra, now it's correct. Um, uh, English Comp, sometimes correct. College, uh, a college experience course, and in California, the third one is is physical fitness. And, you know, that's a hard course, so I'm not knocking that. It's not just the content of these courses. So we're not seeing humanities courses or a really well-taught Psych 101 or Social 101 course, which, you know, that speak to the lives of our, our students. Um, and we're not seeing, you know, this, uh, the kinds of courses students need to transfer in STEM. Um, so the question is, what are they taking and um, uh, what do they, what are they taking? And um, just as importantly, how well is it taught? In, in community colleges in the rest of the country lose 40% of their students after essentially one or two terms. Um, and the majority of students of color and low income students. In California, it's a little different. You lose a lot of students, probably around 30% of students, disproportionately um, students of color and low income, but students stay on, as you saw, 23%, still enrolled. Those are national numbers, so they're, and they're comparable. Anyhow, um, but even so, even if they do stick around to get the momentum as Julie Wong has found in a field of interest. And again, this doesn't have to be a career field. I mean, a, a well-taught, my life was transformed by a well-taught humanities course. Um, uh, the, the sociology of religion by Robert Wuffnow, a great scholar who, who this was in the seventies, who, who, uh, you know, foresaw the rise of, uh, of, uh, the religious right. This was in the 70s. And he also taught me statistics, even though I'd taken calculus and blah, 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 blah. Anyhow, enough of me. Correct <laughs> is not a silver bullet. And I'm not even sure how much of a solution it is. This is, you know, there have been a lot of important experimental studies. Uh, but one problem with the experimental studies is that they uh, you know, have very small numbers of students. This is a causal evaluation, a quasi-experimental evaluation of COREC implemented at scale in, by all 13 Tennessee community colleges involving uh, 80,000 students in this database. And I'm not going to go through the details, but basically, and I'm focusing on math, but the same as interest. They, they, they broke students into math pathways, depending upon their, their field of interest, and they provided learning support in different ways. And they got good outcomes, but these are just 
good descriptive student. More and more students were passing college level math and English. But the question is, uh, you know, is this, was this a causal effect? And I'll just cut to the chase. The main takeaway was the correct model works as a model in enabling students to take and pass college math and English in one year and actually succeed in the second math and English sequence courses. Um, but the, the main reason it does that is not the learning support so much, but because you're helping students avoid prerequisite. So it's not so much that co-requisite helps, the academic support doesn't hurt and it helps a little, but the main benefit is getting them the hell out of dev ed, prerequisite dev ed. Sorry, don't translate hell. Get in the heck out of dev ed. Thank you, Ashley. Um, and for math, the main benefit comes from moving more students. This is the first term math taken by uh, students in the Tennessee colleges. In 2010, the majority were taking algebra, usually dev ed to start. And now two th almost two thirds are taking stats because they're in nursing or criminal justice or uh, and then 15% are taking liberal arts or tech math, depending upon their fields. So this taking a more relevant math uh, uh, rather than the algebra that is appropriate for STEM uh, really helps to motivate students. So I mentioned uh, the uh, that we're beginning to see among early adopters of uh, these kinds of this kind of work uh, uh, on learning. Um, and most of it really is for around the meta majors, the career and academic communities, because they really provide an opportunity. And most of it is focused on the foundation courses for those communities. Um, so, you know, healthcare is obviously bio, anatomy and physiology, uh, the math courses, uh, you know, uh, Social and behavioral sciences would be statistics, uh, you know, a psych, social, uh, and but to really make those courses, make, and first of all, ensure that students take them early on the first term, but make them really well taught, putting your best teachers in there. And this involves a lot of conversation among the general education faculty and other faculty. So, um, and, and I'll send this out and we can connect you with these folks. And it's really exciting work. I will say that this built on the, this other structural stuff, which is important. So bottom line, why in, in our view is to been there so little focus on pillar four. The changes required for the other three pillars uh, are, are not, which, which create the infrastructure for academic career communities where uh, we think that the proving learning, not just in the foundation courses, but throughout really is, that takes place best because learning is different and you wanna learn in context. It's writing across the curriculum, communication across the curriculum. But making those changes is, is formidable and it takes time. Like we estimate four years generally on average. Administrators, and I'm not knocking administrators, they want a qu quick fix and they think they can, you know, do it through these maps and other things. And the maps and things, these other structural things are important. Um, and by the same token, we hear from faculty um, about academic freedom, um, but academic freedom is not freedom to teach. Uh, it's free from freedom from political influence. It's not freedom to teach use you know however you want whatever you want uh, not excuse to use outmoded curricula and and teaching practices and there's this entrenched mindset even in community colleges even among you know we've learned that we're all racist um, that the problem is is that students aren't academically prepared no they can't take social 101 or or uh, you know bio, advanced bio, because they came from a crappy school. Um, when in fact, the, pro the problem is not that students are lacking in academic skills. Um, that's what they are, but that's why they're coming to you. The problem is that they have not experienced good teaching. That's the issue. And the poorer the student, the browner the student, the more likely they will have not experienced good teaching. So what do we do about this? 
we have to remind our colleagues um, that you want to see the movement in the needle and they wonder why, despite all the mapping and stuff, they haven't seen movement in the needle. Well, you're not lighting the fire for learning in your students early on. And um, the other thing is we all talk about equity and equitable, uh, uh, equity conscious teaching, which is really critical. But, um, you know, the, the research from K-12 especially and Julie Wong's research suggests that, you know, uh, this has to be uh, active learning um, on topics of interest to the students that will interest them. And again, it's not all career stuff. And your role, uh, but this means for you guys, USLO folks, you really got to rethink your role from helping, just helping students assess SLO to helping faculty become effective teachers. And I know this varies by college, um, but these success teams or these inquiry teams, as my friend Al Solano calls them, that have been created by field, we found are the best place to have these discussions. Um, because you're, the idea is you want to get students from the start who are interested in your field, including and especially liberal arts. I'm a liberal arts person. We are not selling the liberal arts. And look at the first term courses. They're not taking liberal arts courses. They're dropping out, especially the, the students uh, who, uh, you know, the, that we want to uh, increase equity for. Um, and, uh, you know, politically, there's, you know, guided pathways may go away with the, uh, you know, when the funding ends and uh, some people I'm sure will breathe a sigh of relief, but the need of California to address equity through higher education won't. And um, these ADTs, I know this is just what the CSUs have real value. The problem is it's white students and Asian students who are getting those, A, because the minority students and low income are not being uh, counseled toward them, and they're not helping to start uh, at in the courses they need to transfer on an ADT. Um, and this is not just a, a community college problem, although you guys have a great network there for learning. This is a CSU uh, and uh, UC-wide problem. Um, I understand that you've got some CSU folks uh, on who are really into teaching and learning. I think a powerful alliance between CSU faculty and other SLO people and community college faculty to take this back. I mean, you know, the stuff, the bureaucratic stuff is important. The plans, I'm serious. We sh it's unethical not to have plans, the scheduling, the all that's important. But really, uh, uh, you know, as teachers really stand up for this and saying, you want retention, you want equity in outcomes. This is the solution and we need resources and support to do this. And I'll dust you off when you come back. You know, I'm here to dust you off. All right, um, let me go ahead and spotlight. Thank you so much, Davis. Um, this really helps to put things, I think, into perspective. And uh, thanks for also acknowledging uh, the folks on this call, on this uh, attending this conference, right? They're not only SLO champions, but they have the ability to be learning leaders at their campuses. This is right? what I'm saying. Yep. So, and uh, why with the CSU you, right? folks, too? <laughs> the CSU, you got CSUs doing great work, too. And I suspect, I don't know as much about CSUs. They're doing great learning work, focused on equity, focused on first term, you know, these foundation courses. And um, you guys together could really kick some. Yeah, it's the, the pieces are there, right? It's how to get them connected and how to get people working together. Um, around the students and around equity. Um, we have a lot of great activity, uh, Davis, happening in the chat, happening in the yeah, q and And uh, Libby Curiel, um, one of the other symposium planners, and I will be helping to moderate uh, the rest of the discussion this morning with you. Um, so we did want to start, though, um, with asking you, uh, because you have this nationwide perspective, according to the data, who is doing this uh, ensure learning work, ensure equitable learning work well in the nation? Um, 
ideas to kind of um, exemplars that we could potentially look at and learn from uh, as we start to engage in this work. So I mentioned some on that slide and I would, we can connect you with those. This is usually colleges that have really um, uh, implemented these other aspects of, of guided pathways, especially the meta majors, not just as a bureaucratic major, but building academic and career communities. Um, a good place to look, I think, uh, uh, you know, for urban California colleges would be uh, um, the Alamo colleges, um, they've done a lot of work on mapping transfer paths. They don't have one, you know, a lot of talk about Valencia and some of, I'm not knocking, but they have big transfer partners. Alamo and San Antonio has a whole mess of them, just like most urban colleges in, Cal in California have. They've mapped those out. They're building the, they have every student on a plan. And every student's on a meta major too. So, um, so that, or they call them institutes. They're these fields. So actually when the, when the uh, Alamo colleges, which serves uh, 90,000 students a year, when they shut down because of COVID in March, uh, between that time and the end of the term in May, they were able to reach out to over a million, do over a million personal contacts not just from the college, but from, hi, I'm, hi, uh, Stacy. this is Davis from your, uh, your, uh, you know, Social and Behavioral Sciences Institute. How are you doing? Um, we know that you're taking these courses with professors such and such. I mean, to be honest, they're struggling, uh, you know, to get this stuff online. How are you doing? Um, but it's, it's your field calling you. <laughs> And, and then when uh, registration for summer and fall came along, they didn't have any problem because I have my plan for my social behavioral sciences transfer to Texas State in uh, uh, social whatever justice. Uh, um, so I know what to register for and they offer those courses in the summer because I'm not going to Europe, even if it's not killed, and I'm a, you know. Yeah, no, uh, thank you. Anyhow, but 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 the fundamental thing is all that benefit. Uh, uh, their their vice chancellor for learning said to me, "Look, this is all good, but it's not going to address the equity issues. A because we need to reach. You know, having these maps and the plans benefits advantaged students. We need to actively reach out and help." Uh, students. And then I talked to the, all the presidents right before, all five presidents right before, and they're, they're saying, yes, we need to reach out to low-income communities, but the big thing is learning, active learning. And so this is a serious, they're focused on equity and upward mobility, um, especially transfer degrees or AAS degrees. So, um, so that's an example. They're, they're small colleges, Wallace State in Alabama, Tennessee, uh, Cleveland State that have started to focus on this. But it's really among these 70 to 80 we're seeing nationally that are starting on that. Right. I don't think you need to start that to be that way in California. You guys could go in that. Thank you so much for that answer. It's great to hear the national perspective, Dr. Jenkins. Um, we have another question for you. Um, in a world where SLO documentation is a paramount consideration for accreditation and administrators sometimes are more concerned with compliance than the meaningful assessment of learning, as well as faculty fighting initiative fatigue, not to mention all the compounding stress. No question. Today, I know, I know. How can colleges and states foster the conditions that will enable faculty to approach SLOs as a way to improve teaching and learning rather than, a, you know, I, we did, you know, SLOs, we're ensuring learning. I know, I know, our, check. Our, our data collection, right? Right. So in this, it's really about creating the, re, re, so the, the these colleges that have really done this cultural change, the most important things are not the technical things they put in place, but the cultural understandings like 
It's not the students lack skills. It's as sure as hell that they're not lack skills in abstract algebra. The same course I took in 10th grade in 1974, same course. And I didn't learn algebra through that either. Um, it's that students lack good teaching. Um, it's, you know, um, and, and focusing on as a community, what are our first term courses where we're A, going to light the fire for students? And it's not going to be, you know, in, in nursing, it's, it's not going to be a nursing course. And where are the tough 101 courses that, you know, uh, Econ 101 for business or Counting 101 or, you know, uh, that we're really going to light the fire for learning. We're going to light the fire for learning and where are students going to need academic support and as an academic community. But it's really a, uh, it's a change in mindset to understand that students are going to be in engaged and retained, not through these bureaucratic things. And, you know, by putting it all on the counselors and the student services staff, they're fundamentally going to be retained by being in an academic and career community and getting good teaching. That's easy to say, <laughs> you know, and if anyone thinks I have a swelled head, I have a wife and two daughters. So, you know, when I go home, I just got to, you know, I'm a moron. But uh, it's easy to say, but you have to really build the whole college around that. Yeah, the, you know, this SLO thing is just a bunch of check boxes if you just look at it from an accreditation standpoint. On the other hand, colleges that have this culture and this work on teaching and learning have no problems, you know, meeting accreditation. They just kick it out apart and their numbers are going up. Pierce College, Washington would be another one good to look at. Um, you know, we see a lot of this work being done in union colleges. Uh, people are saying it's, you can't be done with the union. I'm like, no, if you engage the union from the start, you're actually better off in, than in non-union colleges. And they're really focused on light the fire learning that is, that is really equitable. And they have made big investments in this as part of their, you know, got, they've done the other stuff on so the meta majors and the maps and the scheduling and the, you know, blah, 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 which is important. But those should be focused on two things, connecting students to an academic career community and good teaching, especially in the foundation courses and moving on. All right. Um, next question um, here, uh, trying to going to summarize quickly. Um, yeah. I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, lifelong learning allows students to pursue their talents on a continual development pathway, entering and exiting institutions to get to their next promotion, switch careers, etc. How can we get everyone to engage in lifelong learning? You teach them to be confident learners. I know this sounds trite, but all the research in um, in uh, in student success and in teaching and learning suggests that act the best thing you can do. If I had to choose between the whole structural guided pathways thing and a light the fire course uh, or courses, I would choose the latter. But the, the problem is community colleges have such low resources, faculty, full-time faculty teaching five courses, most of these, many of these courses taught by adjuncts. The, the guided pathways thing provides the structure uh, for to for the communities and the plans, you know, to help with scheduling and to help the student see where they are. All those good things, and in theory, at least, creates the time for the meaningful uh, work, which is connecting and light the fire learning. And there's a lot of good resources on this uh, nationally, I, I, my last slide, I think I mixed this was, uh, uh, there's, uh, whoops, I guess it didn't work, but uh, there's, uh, I look at the Everly Center at Carnegie Mellon University, that's my alma mater, but, uh, or where I got my PhD, but uh, they've got a really great site on teaching and learning. I'm sure you guys have some of that stuff, CSUs, but, 
you know, I think CS, a lie with CSUs to create sites like these. This is from my buddy Al Solano. He talks about the five E's, which is was developed by NASA and WGBH. And then there's this thing developed by uh, you psych people, the APA, American uh, Psychological Association, came out with this uh, essential tools and techniques for college teaching based on, um, you know, cognitive science and psychological science. There is a lot of good stuff for college teaching out there. The K-12 schools are actually 15, 20 years ahead of us. I mean, obviously they have issues implementing this stuff, but I think this coalition that we're talking about with this group, aligned with CSUs and others from privates, whoever's doing good work on teaching and learning to you know, adapt these kind of ideas for California has huge power. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, and I think we have some really great chat going on and some questions that I think, um, you know, there's this idea that the faculty, all the onus is completely on them. They have to step up their game and they have to be better teachers. And then there's also like yeah. not a lot of room sometimes to make that happen or it's not facilitated by the institution. And yes. so someone asked this question, are you suggesting equity really can't happen until we ensure equitable learning? And if that's the case, absolutely, then shouldn't colleges or, or systems approach pillar four up front and center while one yes. of your yes. front you're yes. like, yes, yes, right, from but, 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 and this is very important and it's yeah. not just arbitrary. You need to do it by academic field because learning is, con con learning is, is best done contextually mm -hmm. and students have, and you know, the, the writing you need for business is going to be different than social behavioral sciences, which is going to be different from history or um, and again, um, uh, I, you know, obviously students don't know what they want right away, but the research is very definitive. It's in the process of exploration, of discovery. And so the idea with Guided Pathways was to build that process of discovery centered on the classroom. So yes, start with it, but start with inquiry teams by field. And look especially i know i'd make a big thing about the first term but that's where we first of all take a look at the courses if you're in whatever field take a look at your, your courses that your students are taking and actually take a look at the courses who are into your program and what they've taken you will be shocked how did they get this advice and it is not the counselors and it's not the faculty the other idea of guided pathways is how do you provide this level of support for students that an elite well resource, the UCs or privates have in an institution that is radically, I think criminally underfunded like a community college or the a CSU. And the way to do it is to build community across the silos. So yes, start with learning, but please, do it in uh, as as communities and get your best teachers up there on the front line. The more scholastic teachers, which are not bad teachers, you want them in the 200 level courses. But you'll find you'll get more students that by which I mean sophomore level courses. You'll find more students get to those courses. And one thing I'll say, you know, we talk about these pathways and these maps and stuff. I'll tell you. Guided Pathways is, will be a success if more students, uh, underserved students, can get to a sophomore class and the professor said, Davis, you're good at this. Mm -hmm. Have you talked to Professor uh, Teeters? She's an expert in, she teaches English, but she's an expert in, um, uh, you know, working on, on marketing for change management, making this up. I know you do that a lot. Um, and by the way, are you planning to transfer? You should transfer to, you should go to the US, UC, but we'll also apply. But you have to take these courses if you're going to uh, apply to their org science uh, bachelor's program. Or I know someone, she's, uh, she's, this, uh, she's looking, an uh, employer, she's uh, got a startup, she's looking for an intern. I'll write you a letter. 
and they've made it through those one-on-one courses, after that, that is the goal of guided pathways right there. Uh, who knows? And, and who knows what these, all these fields are going to change. Yeah. So, but students do need to have a goal to a direction to go toward and they'll change. But once they get to that sophomore level course connected and confident learners and have a plan, they do need a plan. They're, they're on their way. Well, my goodness. This is based on the research. Yeah. I'm not just, I know this sounds, I know I'm not just sounding all woo woo because I'm talking a bunch of Californians. I'm in Chicago, man. I should be talking more. But, uh, but this is based on the research. Check out this book. This is very, I mean, this is rigorous research mm -hmm. based yeah. in community colleges, centered on the student experience, including in the classroom. Really good book. Thank, thank you so much. so much. Yeah, thanks, uh, Davis, for, for joining us this morning and for helping to put things in perspective. I know we're running a little past 10 folks, um, so, uh, but thank you. We still have a lot of um, questions as well in the chat uh, and the Q&A, uh, Dr. Jenkins, so I don't know if you might be willing to either answer them live today or answer them via the chat today or connect with us a little bit later and we'll send out um, Q&A responses um, to the rest of the symposium group. But yeah, be with, good. That said, with that said, please go enjoy the break. We'll be reconvening at 1015, um, but go refresh your minds because we got more to come. So thank you so much again to Davis Jenkins from CCRC and we'll see everyone in a little bit. Thanks.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, we have this incredible panel discussion today on creating transformational change to ensure equitable student learning and success. Just a friendly reminder, if you have any questions for our speakers, please add your questions to the Q&A box. On our panel, we have Dr. Susan D. Bloom, who has broadened our perspective of teaching and learning with books entitled, I Love Learning, I Hate School, and Ungrading, Why Reading Students Undermines Learning and What to Do Instead. Dr. Shamani Dias, Director of the Preparing Future Faculty Institute at Claremont Graduate University, whom I've had the personal pleasure of learning from directly. And let me tell you, she practices what she preaches. Her course on transdisciplinary pedagogy changed my entire look on teaching and learning. And finally, Sudi Whelan, Technical Assistance Consultant with the American Institutes for Research, is a champion for supporting faculty to be in community, to do this incredibly meaningful work through communities of practice. And so without further ado, we will first hear from our first speaker, Dr. Susan D. Bloom. Okay, thank you. I'm going to share my screen and hope that it works the way it's supposed to. Um, our semester hasn't started yet, so I'm, I haven't been doing as many presentations in the last month or two as I was um, for the last um, many, many months. I've been teaching remotely for about a year now. I just want to thank you for the invitation to um, speak with you. It's really exciting to see all the thoughtful work that people in community colleges are doing. Obviously, I don't have to tell you how important your work is, but it's something that I'm really awed by. So I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, the plan is in 15 or 20 minutes, I'm going to do all these things. I'm going to kind of follow up on where our last speaker left off or one of the implications he suggested was that we really need to think about good teaching. And my, the bottom line is that I think grades have a role to play in good teaching. And by grades, I mean no grades or ungrading. So I'm going to present why grades don't do good things, why grades do bad things, um, what we should do instead, and what the results are. I, I have green trees as the background because I think we all need a little extra soothing these days. So I hope that it calms you down just like the music did in the interlude. So um, I'm inspired by Bell Hooks, who reminds us that the classroom is where the radical action takes place. This is where we actually practice freedom, although we don't usually. So how can we practice freedom for this kind of lighting the fire of learning? How do we create confident learners? And I'm going to suggest that it's not the way we usually do things. I also want us to keep in mind, and I obviously don't have time in my time to address this, that we are not talking about some sort of generic learner. We're talking about human beings. And then that's more important than their learning, which is more important than their performance. So this is just a kind of values equation that I like to keep in mind. But why am I going to suggest that grades aren't doing the good things and are doing bad things and that we should do something instead. Here we go. So grades do many things, but, and I can't go into all the research for all of this right now, but they don't do what we often assume they do. So they don't actually motivate or they don't motivate in any ways that we desire. There are rooms full of studies about this going back 100 years. Some of the names you might have heard of are Ryan and Desi talking about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Alfie Cohn has digested all this research and he has made it really, really accessible in his books. It's Cohn, K-O-H-N, um, in his masterpiece, Punished by rewards or a short, shorter piece that you can get online called From Degrading to Degrading. And he did us the honor of writing the foreword to our book. Um, but grades don't increase intrinsic motivation. They only give a kind of coercion 
which is exactly what we're used to, but not what we're trying to accomplish if we want confident, joyous, engaged learners. Grades also don't communicate. We think they do. Sometimes the assumption is that students need to know how they're doing and the grades tell them, or that other teachers or employers or other institutions of education need to know. But in fact, for a hundred years, people have been demonstrating that grades are completely inconsistent and really unreliable. They give a kind of false precision. And a hundred years ago, Starch and Elliott did three studies. They, they gave people, they gave educators examples of student work in English, history, and math. And they said, okay, grade this. And what they found was these professional practicing teachers varied from, let's say, a, a D to an A on um, how they thought the student work measured up. That's been replicated since then. And we know the grades don't actually communicate with the precision that we um, attribute to them. Further, they, they are in some ways arbitrary because different educators and different systems and different subjects include different measures. So I, this is going to be a really fast um, kind of whimsical um, view of what grades communicate about. They communicate about mastery, timeliness, format, um, effort, improvement, participation, engagement, attendance, extroversion, preparation, interest, financial security, of course, and freedom from excessive care. Those are some of the things that you find when you actually um, look at what people are grading for. They don't say it's about security, but there was, for instance, um, back in March at the beginning of the pandemic when almost all schools went remote, suddenly the New York Times had a story about two students from the same course. One of them went home, this was not a community college, but one student went home to her family's second house in Maine and finished her course from there. The other one went to her family's food truck in Florida and worked to support her family. Needless to say, one of them was probably better able to keep up with the course other one. And so if we are measuring people against all the same um, outcomes, we're, we're not really looking at learning, we're looking at a whole bunch of other things. We know that grades don't promote deep and meaningful learning. As Alfie Cohn says in the foreword to our book, the more their attention is directed to how well they're doing, the less engaged they tend to be with what they're doing. So many of us have heard students saying over and over again, what do you want? Is this right? What do I have to do? How many pages? What? How many sources? What's the font? What's the spacing? They're not focused on what they're doing. They're focused on pleasing me. And in some ways that detracts, in lots of ways that detracts from what we're um, trying to accomplish. Grades don't promote equity, even though they appear to be providing sameness. But as we know, sameness is not equity. Sameness is a kind of violence because we know our students aren't all the same. So we have this kind of platonic model. This is not actually how it works, but we have this platonic model that we have a student, a generic student, and they take the class and there are certain learning outcomes which generate a grade. But instead, it's, the reality is much more like this. We have students with all different backgrounds, different racial backgrounds, different linguistic backgrounds, different ages, different economic situations, different health, different abilities, different transportation, different citizenship status. We have all these different situations. And even in the same semester, some are working full-time, some have care responsibilities, some uh, they're, they're experiencing even the same semester in different ways. So the outcome, their goals are different. 
One might be taking a course because they're interested. One might be taking it because they're forced to. So everything about the students is different. So the outcomes are different too. And that's as it should be. If you take seriously the idea of universal design for learning, then obviously everybody's learning differently. But if you evaluate them on the same exact measure, you're not really producing equity. Another thing we know is grades do a lot of bad things. <laughs> grades definitely lead to gaming the system. So if the goal is the grade and the points, then it's rational to do what it takes to get the points. There's a book that was published 50 years ago called What'd You Get? The Grading Game in American Education by Kirschenbaum, Simon, and Napier. It's actually just being reissued as we speak um, with a new edition, by, with a new um, introduction by Barry Fishman. And basically nothing has changed in 50 years, except more people are gaming the system and the stakes are probably higher. But gaming the system is a direct outcome of grades, which also encourage cheating because you want to do as little as possible to get the grade. So cheating seems rational. And I wrote a book about this. So I, I'm not advocating teach, cheating. I'm not saying that cheating is a good thing, but I'm saying that it's an, a direct outcome of a focus on grades. Grades reduce or destroy intrinsic motivation. This is connected to all the research on the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Nobody has to pay us to eat ice cream unless we're ice cream tasters, in which case we probably dread eating ice cream eventually. But most of us do a lot of things that we like for the joy. And the fact is humans, like other mammals, are um, great learners. We are driven by curiosity, but school often kind of diminishes that. Another thing grades do that we don't really want is they promote competition among students rather than cooperation. And especially if there's a curve, which um, I don't know if your courses mandate, but in some departments, some colleges, some disciplines, a curve is mandated. If you want to see some of the research against that, there's a really wonderful article from 2017 by Shinsky and Tanner called teaching more by writing less. And they teach in STEM fields and they argue that our idea of normed abilities is really flawed and does not lead to what we're hoping for, which is robust learning. Grades also finally um, constitute the principal source of students' academic anxiety. So if you ask students, what are you worried about? Obviously they're worried about paying the rent and they're worried about feeding their children and they're worried about getting the car fixed and they're worried about COVID and they're worried about their kids and their parents. And there are lots and lots of real life worries, but in terms of academic anxiety, grades are usually the primary focus. Teachers also don't like grades very much. If you ask faculty, what's the part of your job you like the least? For most faculty, it's the grades. Okay, so maybe I've convinced you that grades are problematic. So what do we do instead? So here's where um, I come in. So I'm a proponent and a practitioner of ungrading. So ungrading basically just means not focused, focusing the course on grading. And this can be small or total. In my own courses, I go for total ungrading until the end of the semester when I'm obliged to produce a final grade for the course. But even if you aren't as radical as I am, um, or maybe you're not a, able to do it or you're not in as privileged a situation as I am with tenure and so forth, um, there can still be lots of ungraded activities. So lots of interesting, intriguing, meaningful assignments connected to where the student's interests are. Things can be fun and educational, obviously. Um, there can be lots of these sorts of things. The feedback could come from 
other students. The professor, the teacher isn't the only person who can produce feedback. I myself have gone to total ungrading, um, which for me means focusing on these four dimensions. So I'm focused on learning, on student choices, on authenticity, and on reflection and feedback. So learning, obviously, everybody thinks they're focused on learning, but often grades also focus on compliance or effort or time spent or challenge. And sometimes learning requires effort, but it doesn't always. Um, if you're learning language as a child, you're not, um, nobody's drilling you, nobody's evaluating every mistake. And we know that mistakes are necessary for learning. So if we're averaging mistakes into our grades, we're punishing people for learning. So if we keep in mind this principle that learning is really what it's all about, that can help a little bit. But one of the other things we know is humans benefit from having choices. Um, Self-determination theory and psychology tells us that in, there are lots of places where we know that choices make students feel like they have a kind of power, which is what we're trying to do. We want their education to empower them so they can go forth from our classrooms, whether it's to the next level of education or whether it's to a job or whether it's to life. We know that humans are learning all the time. And so we want to give them the sense that they know how to make choices, that if you're going to try to persuade your landlord not to evict you, what is the best way to do it? Nobody's imposing a multiple choice test on you. So how do you decide what genre is the best one to use? If students practice making choices in school, they will have this experience as they go forward. Another dimension of um, this focus on um, student on real learning is authenticity where for let's say writing there's an actual audience so students aren't only writing for the teacher they're also writing for somebody else so kathy davidson for instance who's written widely about education was an english teacher when she began and she had her students write job application letters and her she was teaching them writing and the students certainly cared about spelling and they certainly cared about conventions of letter writing because the stakes were really high. There is a lot of reflection in courses that don't have grades because it's really important for all of us as adults to reflect on our practices and figure out, is this good? Is this good enough? Is this accomplishing the goal without waiting always to be told by somebody else. Oh yeah, that's that's good, that's not good. So like athletes and artists, honest um, looking at people's work develops metacognition. That includes self-assessment on assignments. I've now gone to a single point rubric rather than a detailed rubric. You're either there or you still need some work. I used to do what probably most people do when they begin with a rubric is I had like four categories, excellent, pretty good, you know, or exceeds expectations, meets expectations, not quite meeting expectations, but students translate that into a grade. If you ask them, are you there yet or not quite there yet? They're much more likely to be honest, especially if there's no grade and there's no game in the system. So this is a conversation where we're all on the same team and our goals are the same, which are improvement. And that includes feedback, not only from me, the teacher, but from others in their community of learners. So there, when you develop a community, and that was part of the previous presentation also, some kind of sense of the social nature of learning together because we all have that that's what we're doing right now right we're developing a kind of community so we have people we can turn to and that happens also um, in my courses i ask students for reflection on major assignments and then we have 
portfolio conferences. I, I used to try to do it at the beginning, middle, and end of the semester. That was kind of a lot. Um, I've, I was inspired by Star Saxstein to reduce these meetings to five minutes each. She's a high school teacher. And if the students are doing a lot of reflecting and they've accumulated their portfolio, then they can talk to me briefly about what they think their grade should be. I know that's always the question, how do I develop grades? The students suggest their grade. They say, what do you think their grade should be? And they, they say, well, based on what I've learned, based on what I've produced, based on my goals, I believe I've earned a B plus. Not every student says, even in my high achieving university, not every student believes they have earned an A in every course. So the results of this have been transformative for me. My students are happier, I'm happier. Um, I have much better relations with my students. They still learn a lot. They are, they say explicitly sometimes, for the first time I learned for myself instead of learning for the grade. And for me, that's, um, that's what we're after. So I've edited this book on ungrading. It has chapters, five chapters from people in K through 12 because they have spent the most time thinking about pedagogy. Alfie Cohn, as I said, honored us with writing the foreword. There are STEM teachers, there are community college teachers, there's a community college organic chemistry teacher in this book, um, there's a math teacher. So I, I think this is happening now, there's a movement and I encourage you to question your traditional practices and if you really are committed to learning, try ungrading at least a little bit and see what happens. So thank you and I look forward to our discussion and listening, learning from the rest of our um, speakers today. So thank thank you. you so much, Dr. Boom. I see all this incredible just comments in the chat and these gr great questions. Just folks thinking this is extraordinary. It's amazing. It's some, I'm certainly inspired. Um, we're going to just ask one brief question of you um, after each speaker, and then we'll open it up for Q&A um, after all we hear from everyone. But I guess this one question I would ask is, what would you say to faculty who think that some learners are so used to grades as a measure of their success that they wouldn't know how they're doing in the class if they don't get a grade, or they may not be inspired to complete the learning activities if they're not graded? We have to have conversations with them. If they're not completing, like I've stopped really punishing students for non-completion, but I am keeping track, especially during the pandemic. And you know, if students aren't attending or if they aren't engaging or if they aren't completing the work, I wanna know what's happening. Like, what is going on? Are you not interested? Are you sick? Are you, like, are you homeless? What is happening and how can I help? So that I, I might want to know that, but in order to help them, not to punish them. And how students are doing, um, if they're learning and they know they're learning and they can do the next work, then I think they are getting authentic messages about how they're learning rather than this kind of artificial message that says, this is a B plus, you know? Um, and if, and also I give feedback, um, I give, I've gone to audio feedback for major assignments, like one minute, just like, this was exciting, this was, um, you might next time want to think about this. And I loved reading it. It moved me. I cried. I mean, I, last semester, my students' work was so amazing. I literally cried over and over again. Students wrote song. I gave them all kinds of choices. So the authentic learning was absolutely um, motivating my plan for the class. And they really took me up on it. But yes, you're right. Students aren't familiar with this. And, you know, you should see what high achieving students at selective schools think about grades, you know, they think that's like their birthright. Um, but they actually are relaxed. They, it's taken me a few years to figure out how to put them at ease. And um, 
but they really do appreciate it because they understand they trust me and I trust them. And we have genuine interactions and conversations and they see that the focus is really on them as a human being who is trying to learn. And it, it takes some tweaking, it's, it's not instant. And you can't just do everything you used to do, like have tests and things and not give a grade. You, you may have to rethink a lot of the dimensions of the course. Thank you so much. It's so insightful. And it seems like if you're not as bogged down by trying to assign a grade, you would have more time to connect with students on that level. So thank you so much, Dr. Bloom. Look forward to hearing more from you later today. Now um, it's time to hear from our next speaker, Dr. Shamani Diaz. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, and I'm really, really glad to be here. I'm going to share some slides. And um, uh, Dr. Bloom, you really laid the ground for a very important conversation. And I hope that what I'm going to talk about with multiliteracies um, builds on that, takes from that, and connects with that so that we can have a really good conversation after. So let me share my slides right now. Um, oops. Okay. All right, so, oh wait, there we go. My computer's acting up a little today. It's a bit sluggish. So um, I, you know, actually I wanna say before I launch into the slides that um, at the Preparing Future Faculty Program at Claremont Graduate University, we use that book on grading. We love it. Um, and uh, it is very transgressive. Uh, graduate students are, um, you know, they, they're trying to learn how to teach. They feel very, very, um, you know, going into teaching for the first time, especially if you're adjuncting. Um, so that book is helping them find some solid ground with taking a very different approach to assessment. And what I want to talk about today is something that um, would has helped us create some pathways into thinking about assessment in a very different way. Uh, to disrupt, to transgress a little bit, um, and that's multiliteracies. So um, I want to start with this model. We've all probably seen different versions of this everywhere, but um, what we're trying to do is move away from that transmission model of education, which is from an industrial production economy, from a time that had, a, you know, there was a hegemonic kind of filtering that excluded many learners. Um, and especially as you see, as you saw in um, Dr. Bloom's presentation, assessment and grading and the harm that it can do. And what we want to do is move in all ways, in all aspects of education to this engagement model where it's built on the idea of co-creation, choice, students having authority, where we invite and honor all that rich um, all the rich minds, identities, histories, um, the diversity that our students bring. And part of the reason also that when, when I get to talking about multiliteracy is that this matters so much. It's because we're not just teaching students for you know, our class this semester. We're teaching them to flourish in their future. You know, so it, it's, a, it's a big thing that we are trying to to journey together with our students, you know, as a road into their future. And so the question is, how do you do it? And I want to begin with this. So just for a moment, take a guess what you think this is. Okay, here we go. This is the map of the internet. And, um, you know, so this is our world. And I love this as a metaphor because I think that it represents the, the complex space in which we live. And it has a lot to do with communication, with connection, information. This is our, what you know, has been called for a long time, the information and knowledge economy. So many of the qualities of this world, it's always shifting and changing milliseconds. It's decentered. It's 
interconnected, but also very diverse. You know, and for some people, that's a huge paradox. And the big question that comes up for us with this is, so if this is the world into which our students are going to go, um, what abilities must we nurture for them to flourish in this kind of a world defined by this flux and change the whole time and defined and shaped by how we use information and knowledge? And this is where multiliteracies might be a very useful concept, right? Um, you're thinking of, you know, the old idea of literacy, teaching our students to read and write, right? And um, as you heard in the previous presentation, there are so many ways, genres, discourses, worlds of uh, literacies. And so multiliteracies as a, as a concept is opening it up to all the different modalities, forms, uh, discourse universes, both analog and digital, right? And on, on the right, you just see a short list of them. But more than that, in using these different modalities, multiliteracies is not just the read, write comprehension. It is about all these processes that you see in the word cloud, connect, compare, contrast, curate, select, what is a bias, what's a perspective, explore. And so there could be a lot of fostering of this curiosity to enter into this world, of the joy of being able to navigate this world and to communicate and create in this world. And what multiliteracies does is support the engagement model uh, of learning. And one of the things that's really important, and I was so excited to see the bell hooks quote, is because it is uh, an incredibly, you know, in technology, it's a disruptive technology. You know, it disrupts an old paradigm. It transgresses. Um, but in that disruption and transgression, we are allowing our students to take center stage in their own lives. And that's really a big part for me of liberatory education. Um, so I want to I want to jump in. I have three little frameworks that I want uh, frames rather uh, ways of looking um, to interrogate our traditional or what I call legacy assessments. So very quickly, what are some typical legacy assessments in your discipline, and what feelings come up for you? We heard a lot about this, and for your students, right, in the last presentation, and what might pop into your mind might be some of these things. Right, And what I have learned in, in my own research, in the work I do with students, is how traumatizing grading and just the word assessment is, and it can go for decades. You know, people have been harmed by this. And why do we do it? When learning, you think of a child learning, is so filled with joy, right? They lose it. Where? Why? Because they go to school. <laughs> Um, here's a second frame, a perspective to see from what is the connection for you between assessment and inequities? Um, and which students typically do not perform? And when you think about it, what are the assumptions behind this traditional legacy assessment approach? Um, and some of it, you know, is that the one size fits all. Everybody's going to do the same thing. Input, passive reception, output. Or that uh, performance is an indicator of learning. But you know, that student who didn't do well in my class, was it really because of what I call, borrowing from public health, social determinants of learning? This is what we're measuring, not actually learning. That student who did really, really well in the test, was it because they we are measuring privilege? So, there is a real inherent problem in the logic of assessment that we need to start really uh, embracing and thinking about. And then this is really important, this third frame, which is why we measure, why we do this uh, assessment. The first two, summative and formative assessment, we're measuring. And, I, and then the next three, we're supporting learning to empower learners to foster metacognition, learning how to learn, to make learning mean, meaningful. So the joy, the curiosity, the relevance, the application of learning to their own lives. And if you stop and think about it, when you think of the word assessment, do you see that balance? You know, which do you see more of? And even with the first two, do we see more summative? How much formative work is happening? And really, 
in the realm of how we think about assessment, how much of the number three, four, and five are coming into play. So I feel like in many ways, when I look at assessment, we've lost the balance completely. Now, we, we heard yesterday quite a lot, all students can learn. But the question is, how do we radically change assessments? How do we transgress this realm uh, to really support learning so that we're fostering the learning that is based on the students' own selves, their lives, their lived experiences? How do we empower in meaningful and joyful ways? And how do we then truly activate that engagement model of learning so that we truly become more congruent with the kind of world in which we live and we're preparing our students for. So back to multiliteracies as a reminder, just to sum up that um, this is a way of um, moving assessment to the engagement model. This will help us address inequities inherent in the assumptions and practices of legacy assessments. This puts students' voices and capacity building for the future, for the world in which they're going to live. And I feel like that's a really important thing that we need to give so much attention to these days. This puts it in the middle. And it also fosters a really deep learning. There's a lot of room when you use multiliteracies for flexibility and choice, for um, the students own, you know, we empower them, we give them authority to, to think about who they are, what their goals are, and how they communicate with the world and with each other. You know, a lot of assessment doesn't do that, as Dr. Bloom talked about, right? It just is compliance. Uh, I've done it, check, 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 right? But we really want to move the world of assessment into this space of the deeper learning. And I don't think it's just learning subject matter, you know, it's learning, it's human development, it's learning how to be. And when you think, I've often thought about this, and I did a little bit of research on, you know, how many hours, waking hours of an individual's life is spent in a formal classroom space, is spent in outside of classroom space doing formal classroom related work. It's a huge percentage of your life. And if most of that time of your waking hours is not given, it, it's, it's just given to compliance, as opposed to that student who shared for the first time I learned for myself, right? What a loss of our human potential is happening for millions of people in the world. So I feel like giving that back to students is so important because it is allowing, it's humanizing education. Um, and, and so, you know, this is just a short list, a partial list of some of the benefits of using, beginning to work with multiliteracies as educators. It, in itself builds in all of this authentic, inclusive um, pathways. It connects with students' own lived experiences. When you use multiliteracies, we give them that openness, that choice. It interacts with larger world texts. We destroy the dominance of the textbook. We say that one story that the textbook tells is not the only story, right? We can decolonize our discourse uh, universes more easily. It brings agency and meaningfulness. And most of all, we can actually truly engage in co-created teaching and learning between us and our students, between our students and their peers. And I think in my practice, I've noticed how well it allows you to integrate UDL, to bring in uh, open educational resources so that it's not just patchwork, you know, little band-aid, oh, I'm doing a little bit of UDL here. It's integral to an approach to teach and learn. So then it goes beyond just like, how do I assess a person? It goes into how do I design the whole teaching and learning thing where assessment is just an integral, natural part of the dance of teaching and learning. Um, 
I want to give you some, um, a few examples um, and then a resource. So this was done in a statistics class. And, you know, they're learning stats, descriptive stats, correlations, regressions, all of those good things. But what they did was students worked in teams or pairs. They went out and they picked an issue or a, a thing that they cared deeply about, music, the environment, some kind of social issue. And they went out and found the data. So this is the, the opening up into all the different literacies that they could go out and explore and, and learn along the way, uh, different sources, different perspectives. They found the data, they did all of that, the consolidation, the comparison, the putting together, and then they presented it in the format that played to their strengths, right? Um, in this particular one, they, they had a community presentation, so they had a real audience, so they deeply, deeply cared how it all came together. And it was amazing. Now, as at the end of the semester, of course, they did the usual test, you know, sit down, multiple choice, short answer test. But bringing this into the center of the course was a way of learning and assessing themselves and assessing how they are doing. Um, the balance was there. This was learning and formative assessment that really empowered the students. Um, here's another example from history um, in rhetoric and writing. So in a history class, um, both of these did a pretty similar thing. They um, again worked in teams. Now, this is rich for that collaborative development and picked something. They, this was a historical event. They were exploring uh, the great wars of the 20th century, but they got their evidence, their data, their information from multiple perspectives, poetry, not just historical archives, art, um, and then they could present in any format again. Same thing with the rhetoric and writing, you know, finding different genres, different perspectives, and they had to curate and um, create. And in all of this, there's a huge joyful creative process where they had to think about the form and the, the modality in which they wanted to share what they had developed and found out. So it's this huge amount of pride that comes into this as well. And the intrinsic motivation uh, was there because there was so much flexibility. Um, there was, you know, there are deadlines and timelines. And when I do this kind of work, because I have a theater background, I talk about the development work, the uh, devising work, and then we are rehearsing. And then there is, you know, performance day. And so we have to be ready. And that model, uh, allows a lot of flexibility for all the different life circumstances to get worked out. There's a lot of negotiation that goes on. So this approach to assessment bleeds beyond assessment, flows out into just how we design the learning process. Um, I wanted, uh, there is a document that when you get the slides, uh, you can download. This is just a simple list of a starter list I call of, you know, different modalities and ways of going about assignments, assessments and activities and uh, some ideas for that. And if I've interested you in multiliteracies, here's a really good uh, short list of some wonderful things to read and work that's being done in this, this area of multiliteracies. So I'll, I'll end here, and I hope that I've given you uh, food for thought and questions that we can get into when there's uh, with the Q and A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm just uh, getting flashbacks from our summer class, which was incredible. I recommend everyone go through the Preparing Future Faculty Institute <laughs> at Claremont Graduate University. I do have a question for you. And by the way, you're just getting so many kudos about the examples because theory, it's theory and action, right? It's not just the theory behind it, but like, how does this actually play out in real life? So just want to say, it's totally appreciate that. I have one question for you before we move on to our next uh, speaker. And that is how can institutions support the type of reflection and interrogation of assessment and measurement that you've outlined today? Okay, uh, two things. One is uh, we have more power in our classrooms than we realize. Um, 
and and the small, you know, I call it edging in, and um, the way Dr. Bloom talked about, you know, the little bit or go whole whole way in, we can edge in um, doing a little bit of this, and if you don't have that, you know, you're not protected by tenure, you're adjuncting and so on, um, or your new faculty member. There, you can do more than we, we can always do more than we think. And I know this from experience. I have always done, run the risk of ask forgiveness later and just done things. But the number of times where nobody's ever queried it is overwhelming, you know? So we can, you can bring this in in small ways, a little project, you know, uh, do a little bit of ungrading, do a little bit of multiliteracies, bring it in in a little bit. You may still have to do the end of semester summative thing because you have to submit grades um, using portfolios and, and just saying, I'll just, you know, have a conversation and then we'll think of a grade together, co-creating grades. The second thing is that this is part of, I think of teachers as quiet activists. Our world of the classroom is our activation sp space and our activism space, but then once you can, if you can, look for opportunities to know the research and to speak to it at any kind of forum that you have an opportunity to be. So to also be the advocate if you sit on a committee. I know that this is the ground up way it works, but I do feel that we are no longer alone. Look at us here at a symposium. We have each other and knowing that people doing this gives you courage gives you strength. Um, and so I'm not saying it's easy, but I do feel we have more pathways than we know that we should be looking out for and go for it. Ask forgiveness later. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Dias. So now it's time to hear from Sudi Whalen. Um, and it's such a beautiful transition because um, Dr. Dias is talking about all this incredible work and that we're not alone. And I feel like Sudi's going to talk a little bit more about how we can come together to do this meaningful work. Thank you so much. I literally just wrote down what she said. We're not alone We have, uh, and we have each other. Like that's gotta be the mantra for 2021. I feel like as we move forward in this work, thank you so much for saying that Dr. Diaz. And I also um, really, I wrote multiple notes because there are so many great things that between Dr. Diaz and Dr. Bloom that stated, um, stated that really lends themselves to faculty collaboration. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I have just a couple of slides. Um, and if you were in my session, yesterday, you probably heard some of this, but the group by and large wasn't all in the room. So I want to make sure that we're all talking about this collaboration and moving forward together. Um, when we talk about those big ideas of faculty learning communities, we're not talking about like brand new concepts that don't exist. Remember, faculty learning communities were on college campuses in the 1960s and the 1970s before learning communities were in K-12. We were doing it on college campuses first, right? And so we're trying to bring that movement back to where it was before, where it really originated, where that heart and soul of educator collaboration really began. And so when we think about those big ideas and what that really means. I really loved what um, Dr. Bloom said earlier when she mentioned that different grades and different systems don't align. And I would push that a little bit further to say that do those grades in our own campuses even align? And beyond that, do we even know what that means for our students, right? And so when we come together as learning communities, we shift the focus from the grade, we shift the focus from simple compliance to we're focusing intentionally on learning. We're focusing intentionally on collaboration and we're really focusing intentionally on results. And when we're talking about results, I don't just mean they passed the class, they graduated and they're marked as, you know, part of those graduation statistics. I mean, we can look at those results and what the student learning, the evidence of student learning, the things that they can do, the knowledge and skills they acquired, and we can look further past that and see that the evidence of that learning is students who are prepared for workforce, students who are prepared to go into the next level of education, not just 
students who got the A in the class and have that piece of paper, but then they get to the next level and they're not really ready. And so as educators who are in these classrooms with the students, we are in the position to really get to focus on these specific things, right? And so I keep seeing in the conversation in the chat, you know, what, what about these large classes? What if I have 200, 250 plus students? We're talking about, and I really love that Dr. Diaz said this earlier, that disruption. We're talking about systemic change. We're talking about systemic disruption. We're talking about changing the way we do business so we can better serve students. And that means that we have that bubbling up from the bottom and trickling down from the top distributive leadership where we're making shifting, changing, and going in both directions at all times so that we can make this better for our students. So that means that sometimes we have to look at our class sizes and say, can we really serve our students to the best of our ability if I have 250 students? Those are really hard conversations we have to have, but we have to be willing to do the best we can for our students. And that means looking at the way we allocate funding, looking at the way we distribute our leadership, looking at the way class um, uh, classrooms are established and how are assigned, looking at the way teachers collaborate together and the time that they're allowed to have together. That means bringing adjunct faculty to the table because they're doing a lot of this heavy lifting and work in terms of educating students, but they're not often included in the conversation. And it means supporting faculty. It means supporting faculty to empower them to do the investigative work that is needed to really serve our students. So when we get further to the idea of focusing on learning, um, we're not just talking about learning of just the student. We're talking about learning for ourselves, for students, for faculty, and for the institution as a whole. Um, in the book I talked about yesterday, A New Way by Eker and Sells, when we talk about learning communities, this is what they had to say about that. I just thought this was so such a great quote that the goal is that, F, that each graduating class learns more than the previous graduating class. In other words, we envision the institution itself as a learner. Over time, it continuously learns how to produce more learning with each graduating class. We're not saying we're producing higher scores. We're not saying that, you know, we're getting higher grades and all these students are graduating. And we, you know, we have that feather in our cap. No, we're saying we're producing more learning, that our students are doing better at each year after year after year. And that means that we're looking at ourselves. We're looking at our practice. We're looking at the data that supports our practice. And we're evaluating, you know, not just those summative assessments, but also formative assessments. And when I say formative assessments, I'm including those classroom activities, that project-based learning, that problem-based learning, all these things that help us know, did the student really get it, right? I'm not just talking about that essay they wrote or that multiple choice quiz that they were able to respond to, but that real evidence that they not only learned it, but can apply it. And that's a little bit harder to do. It takes a lot more time and effort. I get that. I know. We're not saying this is going to be the easiest work in the world. What we do as educators is so important that we can't afford to take the easy way out. We have to really investigate our practices as we're moving in and as we're doing this work. So then we look at the other big ideas, this focus on collaborative teams. We're talking about, I'm talking about a structure of an intentional embedded collaboration in which faculty gets to come together and peer review what each other is doing, talking about our work, talking about our challenges, trusting each other enough to know that you care about my students the same way I care about my students because they're all our students and asking each other the hard questions, which is how can I as an educator do better? How can I learn more? How can I be a lifelong, lifelong learner and encourage my students to be lifelong learners? And how do we learn together and grow together? We really let these communities be led by faculty and focused on students. But that's not to say leadership can't be involved or shouldn't be involved. Leadership has to be involved because teachers can't do this work without support. If they don't have the resources, the time, the funding, or just the autonomy to do these things, then it, does, it falls flat in the water. So we have to give them the support that they need in order to really lift these boats up. Like they say that rising tide raises all boats. I say that all the time because it does. If we're all working together and holding hands and agreeing on what our students need to have to succeed, and we're really focusing on how to do that to the best of our ability for each student, not saying we're giving every student the same thing, but saying we're going to meet each student where they are and get them to where they need to be. 
We also have to make sure that these teams and these that are coming together are sharing the responsibility of student learning, that we're not just assigning to everybody else, this is what you have to do, this is how you have to teach it, and this is the way you need to do it, but bringing them to the table to really evaluate and investigate their own work and practice together. That sometimes means that the teachers who are not included in the conversation need to be brought to the table because those teachers who are adjunct part-time faculty, who aren't always able to come to the meetings, who aren't paid to attend certain things, they're still teaching in those classrooms. They're still teaching students. We need them to succeed just as much as we need tenured faculty to, to succeed. So we need to make, make sure that all teachers are supported, not just the ones that we know are the rock stars that do great jobs and do great things, but those little bright lights that often go unrecognized and unnoticed need to be also be included. And we need to give teachers an opportunity to learn from one another and build each other up. I can be the most awesome teacher in the world in my field and think I'm so great. And I always have space to learn from other faculty members, from other educators. And so bringing teachers together to give them the opportunity to do that really helps them grow. And then when that third big idea, and I know this is gonna be sound so controversial, but at the end of the day, it's not about our happiness and what makes us feel warm and fuzzy and everything that's great. Research tells us that we know that collaborative teams make for happier and more motivated faculty, which is great, but that's not the primary focus of the learning community. The primary focus is learning, and it's the learning of our students and being able to assure that students are learning, being able to assure that students are meeting those outcomes that we're saying that they're meeting, right? So if that does require somewhat of a bit of a chip paradigm shift from the intention. We, we're really hoping our students are getting this. This is what we're saying that they're going to get. I'm pretty sure they got an A, so I'm almost positive they got it, to actually looking at results. What is the evidence that the students actually understood it and can apply it? And that is a little bit of a mindset shift. And then we're talking about having giving teams meaningful improvement goals and letting them establish those right? Those teachers who are in the classroom, those faculty members who are looking at their students on a weekly or daily basis, who are, you know, looking at those grades and assessments and everything else, those are the ones who actually know, those are what we call, as I'm former military, the boots on the ground. They know what's happening with these students, right? And so we need to give them an opportunity to identify where those gaps are, set goals to meet those gaps, and the steps it takes to align with those goals, right? But that also means that faculty has to communicate with administration and administration has to communicate with faculty as well, because it's both responsibilities, both directions, to assure that we're, we're sharing and we're meeting the, the institution's mission, vision, goals, commitments, all these things, and that we are all aligning in what we're hoping to happen with our students. Sometimes that does mean revisiting what our mission and our vision really is, because if we're not meeting it, maybe we need to evaluate, do we need to rephrase it? We also make sure that team members in these communities hold one another mutually accountable for results. When we're talking about having these um, groups being faculty led, that's not to say that they are completely out on their own and there's no accountability whatsoever. There has to be accountability. We have to have expectations for what we want faculty to be able to do. And I really loved um, the comment that was made earlier about the difficulty people have in getting these things to happen on union campuses. But if you bring the unions to the table, then you get the opportunity to actually do better right and so what we see is that when we bring faculty and people that have those that kind of influence with faculty to the table and ask them what are the needs what, what can we do and involve them in that we move a lot farther than we do when we just say this is what's going to happen and make it a top-down approach so then the last thing i want to get to here is the, the question of are we putting students first um Iker and cells challenge us to move beyond darwinian culture in terms of colleges and the survival of the fittest that you know we want to make sure the best student is the one that finishes and they you know they fight to the very end no we need to get to the point that we give students the time and the assistance and the access that they need to succeed and that means that every student doesn't need the exact same thing i will go so step far, a step further to argue that we do this without reducing rigor by bringing the level of rigor down or saying that we don't need to be as hard and needs to be less difficult rigor doesn't necessarily mean difficulty it means we're covering all areas, right? And I, we're not gonna reduce the rigor in order to make sure students can succeed. Instead, we're gonna give students what they need to meet that rigorous level. If we bring the level and the, and the requirement down, that's not equity, that doesn't support anyone. If we say, okay, if we lower our standards, the, all the students will be more likely to succeed. Yeah, our, our statistics will look so much better, but these students will be no better prepared than they were before. And the goal isn't for us to look good on paper. The goal is for us to 
produce students who really are, can succeed, who can exit our campuses and go to the next level of education or get a job and earn a sustainable wage so that they're not struggling later, right? That's why we do this. Um, and so that means that we have to actually lead some form of cultural change in order for this to happen, right? That means that there's not gonna be a one size fits all approach. And the reason for that is because all these campuses are different. What's happening on your campus is very, even here in the state of California, what's happening at Mount San Antonio College is not the same thing that's happening at LACCD. The needs of faculty at LACCD may not be the same as the needs of faculty at Las Madonnas College. These things change and the, and the demographics are different from one area to the, to the other. What's happening on your campuses in terms of faculty collaboration is different from one area to the other. So you have to look at where faculty is and bring them along and, and, and provide what they need in order to establish actual collaborative teams and communities. Um, that's just how it is. But that means you have to do the investigative work of figuring out where is my faculty, right? I've talked to a couple of people over the past year or so who are doing a lot of really great work in terms of faculty collaboration within California. And there are some schools that are so much farther along and there are some that aren't. And so that means that you have to look at where you are now and figure out, do I have the funding available? Have I provided the time needed? And do we have the structures in place that our faculty can come together? And if that's not the case, that means we have to figure out what we need to do to make it happen to support faculty collaboration. Thus requires effective leadership. It's really unreasonable to assume that any kind of influencing any kind of change on campus is going to happen without the support of faculty and staff, but it also doesn't work well if leadership is not invested or involved, if faculty is not empowered, if they are not given the autonomy, if they are not given the resources that's, that are needed for this kind of systemic change. So that means we have to have what we call a simultaneously loose and tight kind of culture. That means we are loose enough to allow faculty to lead the direction of their team, would you know, maintain academic freedom, if you will, but we're tight enough to assure faculty are, again, aligning with our mission, vision, values, goals, and commitments, and we're loose on the approach. In other words, how the faculty chooses to address this and how they work together and what they come up with as the experimentation they want to try, that we need to give them the space to do that, right? But that means we also need to be kind of tight and say, okay, if you're trying this and there's no result, if we can't measure any change, if we're not seeing the students are better prepared and the students aren't feeling that way, then in that case, we need to, you know, go back and try it again and bring it back together and do something different. So that's what we call that top down bottom up leadership from the top down we're articulating with clarity our core mission we're holding faculty and staff accountable we're being explicit about our priorities. But the bottom up approach means that we're improved that if, when improvements don't we know that improvements won't work without the buy in So we're giving the faculty the opportunity to tell us what specifically they need, what are the trends that they're seeing, what are they seeing that their students are asking for right. So we're looking at that and then we're empowering faculty again to investigate to learn learn to experiment because we have to be able to do that. So I'm going to get off my soapbox in just a second, but for those who attended my session yesterday know that they could get a free ebook e copy of this, Yark, don't kill me. I still have, I think, nine available slots. So if you do want to get a copy of this book and you want to learn how can I lead change and start, you know, in instituting um, learning communities on my campus and start doing that, you can get this book for free um, just by following the link and I'll give it to you in just one second. I don't work for Solution Tree. I don't know Robert Eaker and Sells personally. I have a stack of books related to learning communities, but when it comes to colleges, this was the one that I found made the most sense because it was really honest about the difference between implementing learning communities in a K-12 campus versus doing so in higher learning campuses because they're not the same. And you can't just take that one process and plop it down and think it's gonna work. And so I really appreciated the honesty in this book and saying, you know, you have to have a different approach, you have to let teachers lead, but you also have to support that. So if you are interested in um, getting a copy of that book, I'm going to pop the link into the chat as soon as I locate it, because I lost my little sticky note here, um, so that you guys can access that. Again, I only have about nine slots available. So the first nine people to fill that form out who did not do so already, I know it was in my session yesterday, I have that list, um, go ahead and follow that link and if you and you can get a free ebook copy of a new way if you're interested in establishing learning communities. But at the end of the day, um, it's about supporting teachers so that they can better support students. That's what that's about. And so 
you know, bring the teacher collaboration together, give opportunity to, you know, reduce the amount of time we're wasting on grading and focusing more on learning. I really love that um, Dr. Diaz and Dr. Bloom phrased and framed this work so well this morning. And I'm really happy that I got the opportunity to follow that up, even though there were really big shoes to follow behind. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Sudi. Oh my gosh, I wish I wish I was one of those people, but I'm gonna have to pick up a copy of that book because um, I know that the nine are just gonna get snatched up right now. Um, I do have a question for you and then we're gonna open it up for Q&A for the entire panel. But the question for you, Sudi, is given how faculty who may be um, you know, pushing the boundaries, transgressing, as Dr. Diaz said, um, can sometimes feel isolated in making some changes and or maybe be feeling restricted by campus politics, um, you know, the old guard versus the new sometimes, what advice would you give to faculty member, maybe they're untenured or they're new or they're adjunct, who wants to build a community of practice, be in community with others, um, but maybe at an institution that doesn't necessarily have the conditions in place to support that work? Um, what would you say to them? So I would say that to start with small grassroots collaboration, um, you don't have to have it. And the fact is, unfortunately, all campuses aren't where they need to be to foster this collaborative work on a large scale yet. And so you don't have to have this whole huge systemic thing happening. Find a few like minded individuals that want to work on how can we collaborate? How can we support each other to make our own practice better so we can better serve our students and then just come to the table together. Look at what data you have available and identify identify what additional data you need, identify if you're able to teach so that you can, uh, can access that data, right? And so sometimes it just helps to come together with just a small group and you don't even have to be teaching the same thing. Someone asked me this yesterday, like if, if we wanna focus on critical thinking, can we all just come together and think about are we assessing and are we teaching critical thinking properly? And I said, yes, absolutely. If you're teaching different classes, then get a few people together who all wanna focus on the same concept to assure we're all assuring students are, acquiring those concepts, conceptual skills and things of that nature. But yeah, start grassroots, just find a few people that you can come together with. You can be on the same campus, you can even be on different campuses, but you can get that peer review and collaboration work going um, from anywhere. Thank you so much. I think you're right. Some of the best movements start grassroots and from the bottom up. And uh, the SLO talks, you know, there's the listserv for SLO. So for those of you who are interested in really doing that work and maybe you're not connected to folks on your campus, join that community um, and definitely start um, reaching out. So at this time, we'd like to open it up for Q&A for the entire panel. And I know Stacy has a, a, she's got a, um, a question there for us. So I'm gonna pass it to Stacy. Great, and one second here, it's trying to add all these spotlights in so everybody can uh, see who is talking. Um, we had a great question from chat and thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. It's been so active. It seems like it is really resonating with a lot of folks today. And we know um, we are so happy that this is getting recorded so it can be shared out even more widely. Um, a question from Sharon um, on, on, uh, on grading. So. They're all for in grading, but our college still requires a letter grade at the end, right? That's the reality of the world that we live in right now. What can we do about that? I know grade are sometimes doesn't show how much my students learn, but if we don't grade, how do we find out if they learn materials? I think that's for me. <laughs> um, so I also have to give a grade at the end of the semester. So the question is what, why doesn't the grade reflect what the students learned? I mean, we usually, and it, it might vary in, from place to place depending on whether you're teaching somebody else's curriculum or something, but we, it seems to me that if grades mean anything, they should mean what students learned. And if so if there's a sort of mechanistic um, formula for adding things up, you, it needs to come out right. You know, it needs to come out so that it does indicate what students are learning. So what are the problems with the formula and how can you change that? In my own situation, I don't use a formula anymore. I don't have points for anything. I don't add anything up. It's just a kind of global assessment at the end of how much students learned. And we, I do that in conversation with the students. They actually generate the grade, which I 
may or may not change, but they, they have evidence, they have a portfolio. So they can show me, this is what I did. This is how much I learned about this topic. This is how much I learned about this. This is how I um, learned about this genre or what um, Dr. Diaz um, called, Diaz, sorry, um, called multiliteracies. You know, this is how I tried an infographic for the first time. This is how I tried a podcast and I learned these skills and I showed that I was grappling with these two units and I put them together and I did this and that's my learning. So when we do all of that, then we do generate a kind of global assessment of what they've learned. And if they stumbled at the beginning, if they didn't turn something in, but they learned, then they learned. And it doesn't sort of matter how they get there. And people have different paths. You know, I, there's something called contract grading, which a lot of people are very excited about, or labor-based grading, um, where it's just about completing assignments. And if you do a certain quantity, then you get a certain grade. And there is a kind of correlation between labor and completion and learning, but it's not mm -hmm. automatic. So portfolios are my preferred method, but it, it, it's just an accumulation like an artist would have of everything they can take with them. And, you know, I don't want to monopolize the conversation here, but one, one of the things that's so beautiful about a portfolio is you can take it and use it to demonstrate what you've learned so that for an employer, for your grandmother, for everybody you want to show, you have this evidence of your learning and it produces pride, it produces excitement, it produces connections outside the classroom, it's more authentic and all of that is so much connected to genuine learning. And so the more we can have that our focus and then use the grade as a kind of final guess, understanding that there is no true objectivity and that this precision is an illusion. And so if you have, you know, a grade of like, I used to agonize over, you know, this person got a 89.7. Should I round up? Should I round down? And that's arbitrary. That's a decision I can make. And so sometimes I might and sometimes I might not. But now that I don't do that, it's much less um, horrifying for me and for the students too. Thank you. I think you put it so well. You're, and it's really capturing that, um, going back to what Yorick was stating this morning, making the invisible, the intangible more tangible, right? Um, to students can actually see and share um, what they've been learning along their whole journey. So I'll turn it over to Libby. Yes, and Dr. Dias, you talk about that, the value of transparency and how important that is. And you mentioned inching your way, like if someone wants to do this work, they want to do ungrading, they want to, you know, change their, you know, praxis. What would you say to a faculty member that wants to do this, but is overwhelmed by all the resources that are out there and just doesn't even know where to start? I would say, um, pick one thing in the classroom. One thing you want to do this semester, like you're really interested or curious about how students use social media uh, and you know they do and you check in with them and they all do some kind of social media and you pick that one thing and you bring that in to a piece of the learning that they do. That might be your first step, that's it. And, and what I want to say that actually empowers faculty uh, teachers so much is you should also document the learning, you know, build a portfolio of the student's work because it gives you, it supports you. If somebody actually says, what's all this? You can say, but just look at what they're doing. And that is why they get the grades they do. So you have your evidence as well, you know, and I, and I think uh, Dr. Bloom really put it one, like it is not an objective, precise measure. It's an illusion. At the end of the day, when I give three points or five points, yeah, I don't like that agonizing either. I'm being arbitrary. And, and depending on how I feel, <laughs> I might give, you know, it's just, it's absurd. But the evidence of my portfolio of my students learning, that 
it's pretty concrete to say they did this. So I would say take one little thing, bring that into the classroom, try it this semester, see where it goes, then do the next thing. Before you know it, you're in it deep. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Dyes. Stacy, I think you have our next question. Yes, um, we've gotten a question from one of our attendees. Um, Grace asks, how do you ensure the work produced is actually Ooh. from the student? <laughs> there are resources that, on the internet that help students obtain work. <laughs> I'd like to jump in on that very quickly uh, because I encounter this question a lot. <clears throat> One, if there is a formative process for example, in building a portfolio, it is very hard to cheat um, because you get to see the voice of the student is there. So you know it's who it is. Two, I think it's grading. That, and I think uh, Dr. Bloom can really speak to this. Uh, grading high stakes is what causes that outcome of I need to go and get something from the internet and I'm going to copy this. Or I'm going to buy an essay. So I think when we change the game, this might uh, go away a little bit. And when you give students choice and authentic choice and meaningful choice, in 30 something years that I've been working like this, um, cheating has never been a real issue. I, that's exactly right. Um, I, I wrote a book about plagiarism and um, it's, I think it also depends on the assignments. If the assignments are kind of cookie cutter assignments where mm. people can just, you know, write an essay about the Gettysburg Address. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, who wants to do that? I mean, it's a brilliant address, but, you know, have a comparison between something that happened yesterday in the student's life and something that happened there that isn't a generic kind of assignment. Um, but the other thing is we all consult the internet right? Like, it's not like I write in a vacuum in an empty room with the internet cut off. So what we need to actually help our students figure out what to do is how to use those resources in responsible, ethical, acceptable ways. And so cutting them off from the world that's out there is very arbitrary and artificial and doesn't actually serve them. So but we, it might mean redoing assignments and you know, having formative um, dimensions, having drafts, having feedback on the drafts, talking about what you can use and in what way. I totally agree. In fact, even just at my level, I'm in a doctoral program. I took um, quantitative reasoning with Dr. David Drew. And for the, I've taken it three other times in my, throughout my academic trajectory. I've never really understood it. I just did enough to get by. For the first time in my life, I understood it and was able to like submit something to conference that got accepted. And it was his, his theory was, you know, real study, you know, real researchers, you know, his exams were like, oh, it's totally open notes. It's totally use a calculator. Like in real life, you know, it's not like you're cut off from those things. In real life, you will be referencing these sources to do this work. And so it doesn't make sense for me to assess you in a way that cuts you off from the things you're going to need to do in real life. And I thought, why aren't we teaching all our quantitative reasoning courses mm -hmm. like this across yep. our system? Like somebody please consult with Dr. David Drew. <laughs> but I totally agree. Yes, thank you. Right. Um, my next question is for Sudi, this question is for you. So you talked about sort of the ground up and then the, right, this, just this, all these different ends. Let's say you have an institution that does want to support faculty learning communities. And they're like, gosh, we can't afford to pay everyone to do this. Are there other ways that they can foster this collaboration, right? That let's say doesn't involve stipends or some resource that they may not have a lot of. And also, you know, you know, what would you, how would you, you know, what would you say to these institutions? 
We're actually working with one, I'm not gonna say which college it is, I try not to put people on blast, but we are working with one college that's doing amazing work, but they were trying to get their learning communities going too, and they ran into the same issue in terms of, we don't have funding to pay all 62 adjunct faculty in this department to be a part of the community. And so my my advice to them was, you know, first of all, when you're starting this going in the to begin with, you don't wanna start with 62 people at all, at all, because you don't have buy-in from all 62, right? And so you wanna start with volunteers, I identify your om your collaboration omnivores is what I call them. The people who will always want to come to the table. They always want to work together. They're really excited about doing this work. Identify who those people are. Ask for, you know, who's willing to volunteer to come together, collaborate, and let's get something going. That doesn't mean they have to travel or go anywhere. We can get together on a Zoom meeting. And let's have this conversation. They did that. And what they ended up having was two teams, one daytime, one evening team of four teachers who would volunteer to come together and get this collaboration going. What ended up happening, and which has been just eye-opening, exciting for me is that those four were getting so much stuff done and getting so excited and they're talking to their colleagues like oh my, this is what's happening this is what we came up with if you want to use this new resource we found that it's starting to grow and more people are showing up to the meetings and this is solely voluntary um, but one thing one thing I will say is that the school is looking at and has started inv investigating how to fund it further so they can get more buy-in and so they're working on adding that to their budget for next academic year but they didn't have it this year and so they said we want to start this and let's see what we can do and they got the volunteers and the volunteers were the ones who spread the word and shared the information and the education and got more people to start participating so just ask just ask say I, we want to hear from you we want your opinion we want your advice we want to collaborate from you are you willing to come to the table and see who's willing to be there and put in the work and start doing it the interesting thing is once once educators start collaborating they get excited and they start getting, and they start doing a lot of things and so it grows pretty rapidly if you give them a chance to lead it themselves and give the, and empower them to do that um, but then also let them know these are the steps to come in terms of resources we don't have it now but this is what i'm doing to get you what you need next year and then also so um, supporting whatever types of products that they need additional funding to produce and things of that nature. So if you don't have it now, get some volunteers, but plan for how can I add funding to this later? I love that you said that. I also, it's almost like a callback to earlier when we talked about, um, you know, you might want to think about bringing the union to the table, you know, working under the existing structures that we have may not be the answer. We might have to dismantle the structures we have and build new ones that facilitate all of this, right? So this could even, you know, addressing the issue about the class sizes, teaching load, all of those things. So I just, I love that you said that. Thank you so much. I know Stacy, you, you might have a, a question for us. Yes, another um, question has popped in from our attendees. Um, this time really focusing on what we are all experiencing right now, right? With the pandemic and an online um, and sometimes asynchronous environment in which we are actually trying to teach. So um, Catherine is wondering if our panelist group could share your thoughts on how to accomplish some of this on grading, focus on individualized learning in this asynchronized uh, online environment and or if we should be advocating to control this rapid spread of online only instruction. So a couple of things, a few things to tackle there. Thanks Catherine for that question, but I'll turn it over to our panelists. Um, I'll, I'll jump in on the uh, online, this, this whole idea of the online space and asynchronous synchronous things. I can't wait to get back into a physical classroom because I just love being there in my whole body. Um, you know, and I'm really trying to figure out how embodied learning happens in an online space. But having said that, the online space actually is a really good uh, uh, environment to really think about um, opening up the learning. You know, it has so disrupted education that I think it also has opened up and disrupted the conditioned ways that both students and teachers think. You know, we, we go to school from the age of, you know, six or something, and we get conditioned into that system. So I would say that this is an opportunity for us if we can be intentional. Um, I think, for example, the use of portfolios, um, the bringing in, oh, by the way, I love single point rubrics. It's what I, I use. The using of a different type of rubric, the idea of co-creating things with students in an online space where you say, okay, let's, let's face it, this is not an easy space. How shall we go about this journey? 
I feel like the shifts that we have to make that I'm making now is talking to our students very explicitly about the process of learning and about the difficulties of learning online. And it has forced us, I love this with assessment, it has forced us to not think about always jumping to closed book timed exams because proctoring software, surveillance, cost, whatever, it just doesn't work. And I can't tell you the number of faculty in my institution who are really for the first time in their long teaching career have started to think, what is a different way to write a question that allows open book, open web, peer collaboration, talk to people. And it's what you said, Dr. Bloom, in our real lives, we don't work like this. Why are we still testing like this? So there is a lot more work to do. And I think uh, one last thing I want to say is I feel like that I've noticed in my institution a big gap between the work we put out in the asynchronous space with no connection to the work that we do in this classroom. So if we do have an asynchronous module, how does it come into the classroom? And I feel that where it's done successfully, teaching is more like workshopping. It's becoming that. So uh, that's my two cents worth. Yeah, I, I, I think um, we have never had as many national conversations about teaching as we mm -hmm. have in the last 12 months. Um, it's been extraordinary. And, you know, I've been teaching, as I said, remotely since March, and it's been really hard. Um, there are all these discussions about synchronous and asynchronous dimensions of classes and equity and access and the digital divide and who has cameras and who doesn't. And all of that has really forced us to think about what are our goals and how do we get there? And, you know, if a student doesn't turn on their camera, what does that mean? You know, if does it mean they're in a parking lot using the Wi-Fi from the library? Does it mean that they're in an apartment with 12 people? Does it mean that their Wi-Fi signal isn't strong enough for the video and the audio? Does it mean that they're bored, you know, that they didn't do the work? It's, it's hard to interpret that. And so I think this whole moment has given us, you know, it's forced everybody to really think about the affordances of some of what we can do better online and some of what we miss. And certainly I miss many things, <laughs> I, but we've, it's also really revealed the inequities and the diverse backgrounds of all of our learners, mm -hmm. which we've, it's been easier to gloss over them when you kind of see all the people in front of you in the room, because they've, at least the ones who come, have shown up and you kind of see them as students in a row. But now we, we're really aware of all the differences. I want to quickly say something piggybacking with that. I think what you've touched on is very important that it's forcing us to think about trust and connection in the classroom. When someone isn't switching on their videos, do we jump to an assumption? Just like with participation, if they're not speaking, are they not engaged? And it is about trust and relationships now. Uh, and it, online space, interestingly, is maybe humanizing the teaching in some ironic way. I want to put on a different hat very briefly. Um, I'm also a distance learning coach, and Yark and I were talking back in the spring, and I was like, when we were trying to plan an SLO webinar, I was like, I'm really popular right now, so let me get back to you later. <laughs> but one of the things I do want to say, and I want to address the last part of that question, which is, should we slow down the trajectory? We, I don't think we can. I'm just being very honest. Mm -hmm. The way that we do education now has shifted. We, we had a huge, large swath of educators who just were very averse to distance and blended learning. They didn't want to do it. They wanted to stick with being in the classroom. And unfortunately, 
uh, or fortunately at this point, it's there's no longer an excuse to say we can't do distance learning. But with that being said, that doesn't mean distance learning and online education is right for every student and that every student thrives that way. We have way too much research, research telling us at this point that some students are really struggling and some students are doing really, really well. And so I think what we're gonna have to look at is meeting students where they are after this ends and making sure that we're offering education in a way that we're serving the needs of all students. Um, distance learning does add an, an aspect of equity to our education offerings because it gives students who can't get to the classroom otherwise a way to get there. However, when we are forced 100% online, we create another equity issue with the, in terms of the digital divide, right? And so we have to be willing to investigate all of these things. But if you're trying to identify, are my students engaging? Are my students you know, doing really well? Utilize the built-in tools in your learning management systems. There are so many logs and resources and ways for you to see did my student where did my student get stuck where did they spend the most amount of time where, what can I tap and then utilize exactly what Dr. Diaz says those online portfolios utilize these other ways of doing things besides just you know clicking a multiple choice and you know typing a long essay there's so many activities and things that we can do online to assure our students are learning but I think we need to be prepared for the fact that and I'm as much as I love tech I hate working from home I'm not gonna lie I can't stand it I want to be back in my office I want to be around with my friends right but but we do have to be pre prepared to do some level of online learning and continuing that go going moving forward because we know that for some students that works really well and we don't want to leave them behind. Oh my gosh, such good stuff. I wish we I, I wish we could just do this forever every day. I, I would meet with you every day. Um, but I know it's not possible and we're about to go to break. So I just want to ask each of our panelists, what final takeaway would you give or piece of advice to each of our attendees who want to envision themselves as learning leaders? Hmm. For me, I will say this is hard to do given all the hard questions. But if you can keep a grounding in joy and courage for teaching, you will have hard questions. Things won't go away, but you will move forward because joy and courage is teaching means you want to bring that to learning and that you care about all learners learning. That's my grounding that I'll share. Um. Why are we in this in the first place? What is it that we're trying to accomplish? And how do we get there in ways that align with the big goals? And how can we be on the same side as our students and get them to where they want to go in a way that has, I think, joy and also meaning? And um, I, I believe that all people deserve to um, be respected and move forward and have goodwill. And so how can we foster that in our practices, in our interactions and in our structures? So that helps me. I would just say to people who are um, looking to be leaders um, in, in this movement is what, if, if you will, of shifting education to be more student focused, right? To just share. When you learn something new, share it. If you're struggling with something, share it because someone else can help you. If you did really well, share it. Celebrate those small wins. When your students are doing really great, share that. Make sure they know they're doing really great. But the big thing here is just to share. Be a collaborator in your classrooms with your students. Build those sense of of those communities within the classrooms, build those communities outside the classroom and share whether it's the good, the bad, the ugly, because we're all going through this together. And when we're honest with what's happening, we can hold hands and work together and do better and make and make the situation a little better. So share what you know, share what you're struggling with and allow people to help you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Yeah, <laughs> Stacy and I are going. I may have made a mistake. I think I said before we're going to break and it looks like we don't have a break because we're ending early today. We're just going to go to the next session, which I'm so excited about. I'm um, talking about intersegmental alignment and how our systems work together. So uh, take it away, Stacy. Thank you so much. And actually, I'm going to turn it over um, to Yark if he is available to introduce our next um, special guest speaker. All right, good afternoon then. Thank you very much to wrap up the day. Um, 
There she is, Dr. Emily Magruder, uh, Director of the Institute for Teaching and Learning at California State University Office of the Chancellor. And she's going to speak about uh, her role at the, at the Institute. And I, I just hope we can, we can learn something from, from, the, from the discussion um, for community colleges in, in, in California. Uh, Dr. Magruder, please. Thank you, Yarek, and uh, everyone. It's uh, so exciting and inspiring to be part of this conversation today. Uh, I am going to, uh, let's see, hopefully, uh, share my screen. And there we go. And let's make it a presentation. Hopefully, that is working. Uh, so let me just say that the, I don't, I don't know how many of you all are aware of this, but the California State University is in the midst of an historic initiative to increase student success that includes increasing two and four year graduation rates for our transfer students. Um, and as has been much of the conversation uh, over these two days, articulation between the two systems uh, based on deep learning and competencies along with collaboration on effective teaching and learning are what will make these goals achievable for us. So there's some good news um, in this uh, that I will share in a moment is, is I'll give you a moment to look at those slides. Uh, I will just say that when the graduation, graduation initiative 2025, as we call it, was announced, which was back in 2016, I myself had just moved from a faculty position on one of our campuses. I was a faculty member at California State University, Dominguez Hills, to direct the Institute for Teaching and Learning in the Chancellor's Office. And so the goals admittedly raised some fears. Um, some were concerned that the purpose was to push students through and that the result was going to be lessening the quality of the degree. But as I often assured my colleagues, if that were the case, I would quit my job uh, because uh, we're all about deep learning and ensuring that our students who earn two and four year degrees, that it is going to help them realize their personal and professional goals. And so it's always been a deep belief of mine that accelerating learning and deepening learning go hand in hand. And of course, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here today, um, but it can also go the other way. Deepening learning can also accelerate learning. Um, so in this slide, if you've had a moment to look at it, there's good news about our transfer goals. And, and this was just shared with our board of trustees this week. And I think it uh, references back uh, Davis Jenkins talk this morning. Uh, associate degrees for transfer, which we're now almost a decade into these, a lot of hard work, collaborative work across the segments, um, they work, um, especially if students opt for a similar pathway when they reach a CSU. So this slide is illustrating here that the students who um, transfer to a CSU with an ADT and opt for a similar pathway at their CSU, um, they have two-year graduation rates that are higher than students coming in with different patterns. And the same holds true for four-year rates. Um, but I'm gonna take another cue from Davis Jenkins' presentation this morning. My ears perked up when he said, I'd take a light the fire course over an ADT or a pathway. And this will nicely allow me to connect to everything else that's gone on this morning. Articulation, and there's been a whole lot of work around articulation that has made these associate degrees for transfer possible. It often focuses on aligning courses with an emphasis on course descriptions and SLOs, and these are very important. But what about collaboration around teaching and learning? How do we ensure that more courses are light the fire learning experiences for students? Now I'm gonna show a headline here that came up just this week. Um, and this is probably not news to anyone here. Um, the article, if you want to go back and read it, it had a whole lot of dirty little secrets about higher ed. And this is not one of the five secrets that was too hot to share, but this one jumped out since my primary focus now is professional development. And this reflects my own experience. My graduate training 
was preparing me to be an expert in my discipline. And there was this assumption that just by virtue of being an expert with passion, that I would know how to teach. So let me just share a quick scenario. This week, I had the opportunity as part of a grant project. We have a grant from the National Association of System Heads to have 540 faculty across eight of our campuses take a course on effective college teaching. And we, I was having a conversation with one of the campuses participating with the provost and he shared a story, which was that at a town hall, well, first of all, he, well, let me tell the story. Um, at a town hall in the fall, uh, one week away from exams, uh, a student stood up and shared that um, going into exams, uh, he had no idea whether he was going to pass or fail the course. Now, um, as we've learned, whenever we hear something, we want to always be sure we're not making biased assumptions about what's going on. But it's really possible that one thing that was going on um, for that student is that there wasn't enough of that assessment at the basic level, that there wasn't enough ongoing checking for understanding so that the student was learning how to monitor their own learning. Um, so as my, uh, the panelists that have just proceeded have shared today, the pandemic has created an openness to thinking and rethinking how we teach. We had to leave the conditions that we were comfortable and familiar with, that we all love being on the ground in the classroom with our students. Every aspect of our work became unfamiliar, which means we can look at it in new ways. Um, and so one of the things that's happened in the CSU that's really quite exciting is that we have offered professional learning this year on an unprecedented scale. When I talk with faculty developers across the country, um, we often think that it would be an incredibly aspirational goal to reach 20% of the faculty on our campuses with professional development programming. And the CSU this year, um, we actually reached 60% of our faculty with long, uh, what I would call robust programming, programming that lasted more than eight hours, often very several days to prepare to teach for the fall. So I wanna think for a moment about professional development um, and just to say that I know I didn't think explicitly about how people learn until I became a faculty developer. I certainly always aimed to be a good teacher, but my framework for doing that wasn't grounded in learning science and especially not cognitive neuroscience. So if I were gonna recommend one thing for faculty in higher ed to read, there are a lot of great books out there. People have been sharing them throughout this um, symposium. Uh, one of them might be how people learn. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a meta-analysis that draws three conclusions about what we know about learning. And this was back in 1999. There's been a more updated version issued since then. But prior knowledge matters, novices are not experts, and metacognition works to bridge the expert novice gap. So I just wanna focus briefly on prior knowledge and then move us to the idea about expertise. Um, Certainly, uh, prior knowledge is always um, hovering around our conversations about transfer. As students move through their entire life and education, right, the people at the next level always want to know what they've learned at the one prior to that. There's been reference today about remediation reform, which both the California State University and the community colleges have been engaged in intensely for the last few years. And that encourages us to think about prior knowledge, right? We have to be more able to find out exactly what are the things that students need to brush up on in mathematics, for example, provide the support at that moment rather than having them work entirely through a course sequence when there are really only a few things that they need to strengthen. Um, equity goals also demand we think about prior knowledge. We have to be sure that we're aware of how cultural epistemologies held by students and instructors impact the classroom. And of course, now with the pandemic, there's much concern about learning loss, what it means for students in K-12 now as they enter post-secondary education, um, but also every step of the way. So let's just think for a moment about expertise as we think about how our systems can work together. 
Um, this image here uh, reminds us that experts have systems of organization. We might think that um, they're, the brains of experts are well-organized closets. Um, and when we think about sort of the larger picture of what we're trying to achieve uh, when we all teach the students that we share responsibility for, um, that expertise has levels. And maybe those first two things there are a little bit easier for us to assess, assess and how we assess the ways that um, our students are learning to organize knowledge and ways to facilitate retrieval and application might be a little bit harder. Um, so these images are nice metaphors that on the left there is a pile of clothes. Um, and that's meant to sort of playfully uh, represent for us that for novices, they might have a lot of clothes, but they don't have a way to organize them yet. And that image on the right might be the image of a well, uh, not only a well-organized closet, uh, but someone who then is able to um, pull together knowledge in new and novel ways to create new possibilities. Um, so um, what does faculty development have to do with all of this? As experts, we forget what it was like to be novices and we develop blind spots. When we have the opportunity to learn together with faculty our own disciplines, but also not in our own disciplines, we can surface our expert thinking processes and thus better apprentice students into them. And, you know, why not do that uh, across segments with our colleagues, again, who um, work to uh, cumulatively um, give students the education um, that they're going to take into the rest of their life with them. So our larger goal, of course, might be represented here is that um, the big goal is that we're trying to develop lifelong learners and sometimes this larger goal can get lost when we're focused um, too mechanistically um, or too simplistically on assessment. So to produce skillful learners, we have to think about how we structure instruction and how we structure assessment. And so the third piece of that finding um, from how people learn is that metacognition, thinking about thinking, uh, can help bridge that gap for students between novice and expert. Uh, but I also want to think about, and it, let me just backtrack for a moment, if we're going to build metacognition into uh, the way that our students learn, that means, of course, the work that we've all been engaged in and talking about over these two days of redesigning instruction and assessment so that happens, so that students are thinking about how they're learning so they can transfer that into all the novel experiences they'll encounter when they have moved beyond our classrooms and our degrees. But we also want to think about, right, how do faculty learn? How do instructors learn to teach better? And we want to think about, um, we've had some conversations here, what faculty development looks like in this context. So I've playfully taken the language there about metacognition and suggested that if we have a metacognitive approach to instruction um, that can help instructors learn to take control of their teaching by defining teaching goals and monitoring their progress toward achieving them. Uh, so um, I could describe a few intersegmental projects that I've been involved with. Um, if you'd like to hear about them, some of the most exciting work that I've been able to do in my time directing the Institute for Teaching and Learning in the Chancellor's Office um, has been in projects that have had community college faculty and California State University faculty working together side by side. Um, there are questions that I have here on the screen. Uh, but I also want to know what questions you have. So I'm going to stop sharing now and uh, open it up. All right, fast. Who's here? Uh, Yarek, I believe we've lost your audio. 
just uh, just when I fixed my camera, now the microphone is not working. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, fascinating discussion. Really appreciate the points to 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 end the day. Uh, you have asked earlier in your in your talk, a uh, rhetorical question, I suppose. How about collaboration around teaching and learning? If you could perhaps uh, uh, from from that perspective address what it is that we could do between the two systems or or how do you think uh we could structure our discussions here again in terms of faculty preparation and making sure that students attain competencies that they need to perform in your in your system well I, and uh thank you Yarek, and I, I see that there's a, a shout out there to Cal State LA's Center for Effective Teaching and Learning. In fact, um, much of what I'm sharing today comes from my collaboration with the, the team there. It's really an excellent team. Mm. Um, what, what I think that happens is that sort of everything that we're talking about, that we know about how students learn and that, right, defining the outcomes and folding assessment of how students are learning um, into that at every level from checking for understanding every step of the way inside of a course to building up the larger assessment of student learning within a program or a degree. Um, we can turn around and um, apply that to think about the learning for faculty. Uh, so, for example, in one of the projects that I've been involved, I'm involved with right now, which is with funding from the California Education Learning Lab, which again is <clears throat> we have at the state level. Uh, the governor's office putting funding into professional development. We have a project that some people here may be involved with that's based in reading apprenticeship. So I'm partnering with my close colleague, Nika Hogan of the California Community College Success Network and using the idea of uh, reading apprenticeship. Um, and for those, I may be talking to people who are familiar, but we, we often think that students have learned to read back in third grade, right? That in third grade, you shift from learning to read to reading to learn. But in fact, um, one of the key ways that we as experts in each of our disciplines uh, communicate is through reading and writing. And so our project brings faculty, actually STEM faculty and math faculty together with a broad definition of reading, but thinking of um, any text um, including a formula or a piece of equipment in a lab is something that we read together. And developing, again, to touch on what Davis Jenkins said this morning, active learning, thinking about how bringing the act of reading into the classroom as an active learning and problem solving activity where we show students how we read it so we surface our expert thinking but then give students multiple opportunities and well-structured peer groups so that they can read together, so that they start to see and we make transparent how we're all moving from novice to expert and doing that in um, expert ways. That's great professional learning. Now, a lot of what I've heard people talking about faculty learning communities can take place in a, um, uh, in a campus context, um, it's so exciting when we can do it across institutions and across segments. Because if we can sort of develop together, we can collaborate, not just at the level of course IDs and course descriptions and student learning outcomes and agree that these are equivalent, but that we actually form our own learning communities together where we have uh, start to define and have common conversations about what expertise in these areas are, then we're all better able to define our instructional practices and our assessment practices um, so that um, we're apprenticing all of our students into that together. I think very much in line with, with, with this thinking, there is just a question that just popped up in, the, in our um, Q&A uh, section. Um, on one end, course outline of record uh, dictates um, course content, right? So we do we do need to have it, but then some may find it uh, restrictive, and I think that's that's what the question is about. Um, what advice uh, do you have when our articulation officers tell us that one college won't articulate 
won't give articulation unless we add it in, unless we add in another topic. Uh, we want our classes to count for, for transfer, right? Uh, why is there so much micromanagement over the list of content topics? Oh, um, well, gosh, I, I don't know how I can address that question of micromanagement, um, but I, in terms of, um, you know, that's my concern is that two times we get lost in the details of articulation. And I think that if prior to that, we had a basis, I think there was a conversation about trust today. How do we develop trust across the segments um, so that we understand that those artifacts that we use for articulation, right? The, um, that course outline, um, the, the learning outcomes that we put into those articulation systems, it's when we've been able to have the opportunity to have conversations together that we have trust across those systems so that we know that those the language that we put on the paper to describe the learning outcomes is connected to that deeper sense of what we do uh, to teach students and to assess their learning. Thank you very much. If, if you could uh, again go back to one of the comments that you made earlier, and this has to do with the fact that um, as the uh, higher ed um, article says, uh, faculty in higher education have very little teaching preparation, right? Um, what are the systems? Do you have any 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 hiring perhaps practices or once faculty are hired, what supports do you offer to, to, to those new, newly, newly arriving faculty members? You know, those are, I mean, those are excellent questions. I think we, and this is what the field that, that I've moved into educational development uh, thinks a lot about these days. Um, you know, we construct professional development um, still in higher education, at least in the four-year universities. I don't, I don't know if it's different in the two-year system, but um, we structure it as optional and extra. Mm -hmm. And we're often looking for ways to incentivize faculty to do it. Um, what I can say is that, you know, the, what the pandemic opened up is that all of a sudden everything was unfamiliar and there was this incredible openness. So if faculty developers and, and the CSU went from offering program and sometimes hoping that people would come and that it would fill up so that they could continue to have funding, we then all of a sudden had the opposite problem. Everybody was coming in. So I wouldn't have wished a pandemic on us for that to happen. But the question is, how do we go from here? Um, so, we start to look with, you know, creating intrinsic motivation. If the professional learning is of high value, um, we might use a stipend. I heard a reference in the panel earlier of bringing unions to the table and talking about how can we can remove any barriers to getting people into these situations. Um, but we have to ensure that the professional learning experience is rewarding for its intrinsic reward and then think carefully about how we build in recognition. A stipend is one form of recognition, um, but community recognition. I'm finding a lot of the faculty developers this year talking about um, the faculty who are participating in programs this year while they're still teaching, which is incredible with all the demands that the pandemic is placing on people. Um, that the community, having the opportunity to be together and to talk about teaching is, um, is a reward in and of itself. Um, mm -hmm. Now, whether we would get to the point where that would be recognized in our system um, differently in um, reappointment and um, promotion and tenure decisions for all of our faculty, whether they're on the tenure track or off the tenure track, um, there are a lot of people that hope that might happen. Um, but for now, um, I think that community and finding our passion for teaching helps. And I, I just, I love the idea of being able to do that more across our systems. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Magruder. Um, uh, we, uh, we skipped the break. We'll just go ahead and, and, and 
uh, finish up the uh, day day number two of the conference. Thank you, thank you, panelists. I'll take it over to uh, uh, turn it over to Stacy and uh, let's finish it up. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you so much, and thank you so much, Dr. Magruder. I think we're opening these pathways to dialogue, right? To make those connections happen, to help to make sure everyone is supported. So at the end of the day, we are really serving students in the most equitable way that we can. So I'm inviting um, the rest of the planning group and uh, for panelists who would like to participate in this kind of next steps discussion. Um, and we hope you're ready um, for our attendees in the chat um, to also engage with this conversation as well. You've been here a lot for the past several days. Where do we go next? What is the next step for this work for you? What is the next step that you need from this community? What is the next step for the SLO Symposium 2022? So um, please feel free um, to engage and chat. Um, I've also, um, we have Susie Nitzel from Fresno City College helping us on the back end. If you would like to voice up um, your opinion, please raise your hand and she can also unmute you as well. But we have about 17 minutes um, uh, to kind of go through this together and we'll turn it over. Um, in terms of next steps. And our panelists can also jump in as well as what they see next steps potentially for this work too. So I, I, I think that from my perspective as, as, as uh, an, an organizer, and this is again, uh, SLO symposium number eight. So I'm, I'm just absolutely ecstatic about the fact that it, that it actually has been so many years and, and look where we are. This, I, I, someone already mentioned, right? We never had that many conversations about teaching and learning before. So I'm certainly very, very, very optimistic. I'm looking forward towards uh, the future. Now, as far as our uh, technology here, I think a thing or two may be said about that simply because uh, Zoom is here with us to stay. We can record these materials, we can distribute them. Uh, we are going to uh, be able to, to uh, disseminate the message to really uh, make sure that the, that the field, meaning our faculty and faculty leaders, learning leaders out there are, 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 are not alone anymore. So we, that's, 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 that's really the goal. So again, as far as that's, that part is concerned, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly happy to see how we are moving forward as a, as a, as a team, as a group, as a community. Uh, when it comes to uh, next year's symposium, we already asked the question. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it's going to require any type of voting and whatnot. But, but certainly looks like uh, Zoom is a is a great way to to really bring, as you saw, fantastic speakers from across the spectrum across the country. Uh, I think that's that's very important, and the lesson that 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 cannot be forgotten for next time around. It's just much easier, much more uh, feasible to reach out to people. Um, who are geographically uh, far away from us. So again, thank you, thank you very much for all the all the speakers, and thank you for all the work that 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 has uh, has been accomplished. Uh, the planning team has just been absolutely fantastic. You you saw the emails, you saw the work that 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 went into this. It's it's just 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 truly amazing uh, efforts. So kudos to everyone who's been who's been involved in this. It's been a great pleasure working with you. Great, and um, we're already getting some comments in the chat, uh, Yarek, around distance options for, for this type of uh, conference right in the future so we can more widely distribute this information and get people engaged. So definitely something to consider. And I am highly encouraging um, all of our attendees, we will be uh, putting the evaluations both for the Friday sessions, if you attended those, as well as today's Saturday sessions into the chat where you can also weigh in what do you want SLO Symposium 2022 to kind of shape up into as well. And I'm also going to make sure, yep, we're more of us are being spotlighted as well to kind of reflect on um, some of what's been happening. What, where do we go from here? I think, Stacey, the one thing I might add is that I know that we've shared so many resources and had just a really profound experience hearing from so many people. And it can feel overwhelming as an audience member and as a participant leaving and thinking about how are we going to implement all of these things and how are we just going to, you know, 
um, start on day one, Monday when I go back onto email or join my class, you know, how am I gonna do all these things? And I think that I was reflecting on what Dr. Dias was saying and that really maybe we can just start by identifying like what's one thing I'm gonna bring to my team on Monday? What's one thing I'm gonna bring to my students? And what's one thing I'm gonna bring to myself? Remembering that that self-care is also a really uh, important part of the equity work. So thank you for that. Such a great point, Anthony. <laughs> For me, I just wanted to share that um, just in being on part of the planning team, I was just so inspired by everything that I was learning uh, that I reached out to some folks that I know are really equity minded on my campus. And I met with them last week, actually. And this person and I was this one person and I, we just said, you know, maybe we just need to start this from the ground up, you and I. And we both agreed to invite one other, one or two other people to join our group. And this semester, we've invited each other into each other's Canvas courses to be observers and we're going to meet with each other regularly and give each other feedback about how we can be more equitable practitioners, equitable um, faculty members and just be really honest with each other, speaking truth and love and just go through this journey this semester and document our experience so that we can take it back to the campus about a model that maybe others can follow. Great, and that's such a good point, Libby. And it makes me step back and think too of um, the purposefulness <laughs> of uh, our conference theme this year as well, right? Ensuring equitable learning, because I think we're realizing that um, we ourselves uh, in the SLO assessment space might have already been siloed previous to um, these kind of larger discussions and conversations. And so it was, um, with a lot of intentionality, right, that we thought about how do we turn it, um, wrap this in with guided pathways? How do we wrap this in with equity? And how do we start seeing ourselves more as learning leaders? Because it's going to take us working with folks who are, you know, working in those areas across our campuses to make it a collective effort, right? Um, if we were are trying to change the campus one person as ourselves, um, that's just not going to work. But if we can bring more allies on board too, who see these connections, right? Guide pathways, pillars one through three, what are you pointing towards, right? If it's not ensure equitable learning at the end of the day, we have built a better system to get students through, but we still did not ensure on our promise to our students um, that we are providing the best education possible for them. So uh, panelists, um, thank you so much for sticking it out also too. If you have any thoughts, feel free to jump in as well. I just want to jump in and piggyback on uh, what Ms. Curiel just said a moment ago, because I thought it was so awesome. The value of peer observation and peer feedback cannot be understated. And something as simple as what she's saying, like inviting each other to each other's classes, like check out, check, come check me out, see what I'm doing, where can I grow, you know, those kind of things. It's so simple and it's not that complicated, but it has, it's so fruitful. And, and also just the feeling of being supported and feeling like someone has my back makes a huge difference. So I'm really glad that you shared that and that you're starting that grassroots roots movement on your own, Libby. That's awesome. And could I piggyback on that and say, I mean, you know, the, you know, having an open door to our classroom where people could come in and observe is not something that everybody in higher ed is willing to do. What if we could do that again across the systems? And then maybe if we could see into each other's classes and understand and build this trust, like, oh, we are all teaching. Maybe if there are times when articulation is bumpy, it's again, it's because of just a plain old lack of knowledge and lack of trust that we're all teaching students toward the same goal. And given that our system now has these segments, like we could make the, the handoff and the transition for the students smoother and uh, having Canvas courses right, gives us a way to do that that might make it easier than it was in the past. Just reflecting, we're getting a lot of love in the chat and we're sending that back to you as well. Thank you so much for attending. I know it's even a Saturday and you are here to learn, you are here to engage. And we are so thankful for the work that you are doing on behalf of your students and then also on your campuses as well to make transformation happen in education. So thank you all for that as well. Um, 
we also have um, folks sharing. Great idea, Dr. Magruder, um, in terms of maybe that's opening the doorways. We have a connection to you now. Um, so maybe there is an opportunity to work between at least our two systems, the California Community College system and the CSU um, to maybe start piloting some of those, um, those opportunities. And I think that goes a long way to also uh, opening up the conversation more about pathways too, right? Um, having that alignment and uh, for having as much as a seamless transition as possible for our students um, who do end up transferring because we also wanna mitigate some of that transfer shock and then work together to best support them in a wraparound sort of ways. Uh, Libby brings up a great question in chat. Who's gonna invite the UCs? Who's got that connection? Well, I, I, I think we already talked about it. There is there is some venues. So it's something that that that's uh, to be worked on, maybe maybe that way. But but again, we are we are not alone. Uh, uh, Dr. Margruder is here and I'm I'm sure that she can she can probably ensure some 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 connection with our UC colleagues just as much. So something something for us to explore in the next uh, weeks and months. There I'll just, I, I know there are people willing, and again, I think that maybe we've figured out that some of the barriers that were there in the past, you know, a forum like this, you know, anybody can come. Dr. Bloom or Dr. Dias, any kind of final takeaway thoughts, advice for our group before we wrap up? Well, one thing that occurred to me as you were all talking um, about how hard this is and how you want to start by introducing one thing at a time, it occurred to me that that's a very humane and appropriate response, but that's not what we usually ask of our students. We usually ask our students to do everything and to do it perfectly. And so just in terms of like, the metacognition of our own learning as opposed to what we take into the classroom. We want to be realistic and humane about what it's actually possible to change in the course of a semester. And in some ways, what we've built into the structures of our colleges and universities is impossible for anybody to actually do. You know, I, I mean, your students have very complicated lives. They're taking several courses at a time in different disciplines and different fields, all of which have different conventions and read different things and write and produce different things. And expecting them to do it all flawlessly or expecting ourselves to do this flawlessly is unrealistic and inhumane and probably doomed to fail. And so I would encourage us to take the compassion. We, I hope show our colleagues, show it to ourselves and then also show it to our students because learning is not predictable and you know unilinear and automatic. It's a very complicated thing and we are human with all of these social and emotional and cognitive and physical considerations. So we need to keep all that in mind. Dr. Bloom, can I just say, I'm so glad you said that because my son's in college and I will never forget, he's doing this thing called 168 hour assignment where the instructor asked them to document. And then there's this instruction for every, you know, one, you know, class you're taking three units, you've got to account for nine hours to work on that class outside of class. And he does this assignment and he looks at me and says, mom, I'm done. And can you just check it for me? And I, I go through and I go, when are you eating? When are you, when are you going to brush your teeth? Like I looked at this and it just seems so unrealistic and he's completely supported by me. And I just thought about students that work, go to, you know, have children. I mean, just, I mean, all of the, and I thought to myself, like how, we have to reframe what we like that. I feel like that's so we have to change that ideology that for every three unit class, they have to spend nine hours and they have to block it out. And we have to 
keep that in mind as we are designing our courses. We taught when Dr. Dias talks about designing an ethical course, right? Like having ethical course design. How does that play into the way that we pace our courses and people learning in our classes? I, I want to add to that and also to say how inspiring this whole um, event has been. Um, inspiring because there are teachers here asking hard questions. Uh, and really wanting to do the work. And I think that's really important. And one of the things I'm hearing echoed, and but certainly in the last couple of comments, is uh, the culture that we want to really transform, the culture of perfectionism, the culture of uh, linearity, like this is this machine production. And if there's one thing we can take away from here is learning is a, a culture of being and growing. It's very human and it's organic, it's complex, it's not predictable. And it's so beautiful if you would let the vulnerability happen. But you know, as teachers, we, we too have grown up in the system. We don't like feeling this, what my students call the wobbliness. Well, I like solid ground, you know, but let, let's accept that this is, um, open space and and that the best most joyful learning comes with that courage to be vulnerable so as much as we need it we have to bring that to our students you know, so if we have a year between now and the next meeting when we get together like this maybe maybe we can just allow some vulnerability and space and time and breath into our work Well, I'll take a breath right now. Phil, thank you so much, Dr. Dias. And I, yes, I, we are luckily going to continue on these conversations and I'm going to start moving us into, unfortunately, wrapping this wonderful um, symposium up with just some final information um, for our attendees here. So you've been seeing it posted in the chat, but here is that opportunity to continue that dialogue, right, between SLO Symposium 2021 and SLO Symposium 2022. Get involved, get in these Friday talks. This is a really a great community space for sharing and support, right? Uh, that is what we are trying to build. You can see it is one of our outcomes for this event. You are not alone. As, as Sudi was sharing, and some of the other things that we want to continue to reinforce, lighting that fire for learning, right? Humanizing education, disrupting education. That is the space where we are going to meet together to continue that work. Also here, um, so to get information on those events and uh, other resources that Yark and folks will send out, make sure to join the listserv so that you get on the mailing list for that. We will be um, emailing the conference attendees for this, but also encourage your colleagues to join that network as well. And then thank you. And I will turn it over to Yark for closing. Well, what can I say? Thank you very much for attending. Thank you again, the, 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 the planning team. It has truly been inspirational. Uh, fantastic event in, 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 in so many different ways. Uh, the, the quality of discussions and the quality of exchange at the networking. Um, it all played out much better than I thought it ever would. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that we were able to overcome the uh, technological uh, problems. Um, Looking forward to collaborating with you. As uh, Stacy just said, don't hesitate to 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 stay in touch. Don't 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 forget that that we we are not alone. We are really learning leaders. Uh, looking forward to collaborating with you all in the next year until the next symposium. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.